So when I was 13, okay, yeah, this is this is a contribution that really, really impressed a lot of people when I was little, but it's not one that I'm particularly proud of. This might take a little while, but I wanted to go over this one in particular. So when I was in like eighth grade physics and stuff, I was really damn good at physics and it was it was effortless for me. And so a little bit before this, actually, I thought of a of a new way of perceiving the world because like that's ultimately what it comes down to is is like a lot of people who are super interested in science just brainstorm new perceptions of the world. And I came up with this um, hypothesis. And my hypothesis was, or rather it was a conclusion. My conclusion was figuring out the fundamental nature of reality is going to be a task of rewriting your entire perspective rather than putting the puzzle pieces together. It's, it's, not, it's not at all like what people think it'll be like. It's been a while, actually, since I've done anything in, like, math or science. Um, I lost my passion for it in school. Um, and I'm, I'm really rusty on all of it. So, yeah. And all my information is a bit outdated, too. Because I really stopped, like, pretty much anything beyond, like, 2014. Like, in 2014 and beyond, I, I don't keep track of any... any like, I used to... Um, read all the news and all that stuff, but yeah, anything beyond 2014, uh, that my information is, is completely outdated after that point. So any new discoveries that, are, that may prove something wrong that I said that happened after 2014, I have no clue anything about it. I, so the holy grail of physics is or just science in general is the theory of everything okay a single equation that you can write down on a piece of paper preferably a small equation um that describes the universe at its most fundamental level one equation to describe all the rest of them and see the laws that like newton and, and later einstein came up with like, they're great but when you get to a quantum level, they don't apply anymore. An object in motion will stay in motion. Yeah, sure thing, my guy. Maybe to our measuring tools that are, you know, five million, 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 million atoms in length, but not the ones that are five atoms in length, then it doesn't work so well anymore. It seems like subatomic particles just like to accelerate, just change directions, decelerate, without any force acting upon them. And it's it's not just that, it gets worse. Sometimes they get entangled with another particle and their uh, spin and polarization and whatever, they can be used to determine the properties of the particle that they're entangled with, even if the particle is in theory, not right, but in theory, light years away. And it gets even worse. Sometimes the particles just like to just disappear. Like they just go in and out of existence. Sometimes they appear in two places at once. Sometimes they teleport, which means technically they're also time traveling if they're teleporting. Sometimes they exist and don't exist at the same time. And, and it just gets even more confusing from there. So, for, for the longest time, not for the longest time, actually it's been pretty recent, but scientists have just been trying to unify the, the theories that we have on the quantum understanding of the universe with Einstein's equations, or just macro physics. You know, physics on the scale that we can actually observe. And reconciling both of these has proved to be quite the challenge. But I think that 
Mm, maybe not in the way that a lot of people, a lot of scientists would see it. Um, but I think a lot of scientists are very smart in one way, but very stupid in another way, which is they don't know why they do it in the first place. They don't know what, what their purpose is when just on this on this conquest to reduce uncertainty about the universe. They don't actually know why. They don't actually ever stop to think whether or not they should do it. It's not like there's any harm in doing it, but... Um, They've never, they never thought like, they never put any mental energy into, into understanding themselves. They put all their mental energy in understanding the universe, none in understanding why they themselves actually care so much about these things that matter so little. So in my opinion, it's all about perspective. You do it, science, people do science because it's fun. Like that's, that's, that's what it is. If it stops being fun, you shouldn't do science anymore. You shouldn't participate. And in my opinion, the only way and the only meaningful way, like the best way, like on, on a human hum, humanitarian level, to, to understand the nature of reality is to treat it like a game, is to, is to play the game. It's, it's to abandon our perspective of the universe and see it from a new angle. See, a lot of people have this this idea of science, which is, it's correct, which is um, that your senses will abandon you the deeper and deeper you go into science. They'll, they'll disobey what's actually going on in reality. So at a certain point, you have to actually think about it in a, in a more philosophical sense. You have to actually consider what's more important to you, objective uh, true reality or the sensory reality that you're given and in my opinion the answer is clear there's only one reality that matters and that's the reality that your your brain shows you everything else is meaningless in my opinion and simply being able to write down equations that describe the nature of reality is worthless and i thought this way at that time as well when i was little i think the only the only um the only way that scientists can actually um not can the only way that scientists should proceed when trying to figure out the theory of everything is by trying to actually understand it themselves <laughs> by trying to shift their perspective and and understand the universe in a new way for example string theory is understandable you know you can explain it to somebody string theory looks at all things as being made up of stupidly small strings that vibrate at different frequencies which determine what the string gets uh, rendered as or rather interpreted as um it's like a simulation in that way, but yeah. And, and this fundamental equation, this theory of everything would need to describe not only the strings, but also how and why the universe interprets each frequency of vibration of each string as such um, particle or whatever, you know? And it's definitely an interesting, interesting way to perceive the universe. Um, I get the appeal. Uh, I was really drawn to it also, but not, not, like that, not that much. Um, and I think in order to become a great scientist, it requires people to actually understand the science, not just come up with an equation for it. You don't, you don't uh, talk about great minds as people who, who were able to write a book with certain ideas in it. You talk about great minds because they were able to understand things in a different way than most people were. Nikola Tesla was um, a famous example of someone who saw the world in in a different way. He saw the world as frequencies and wavelengths. Let me let me. I want I want to put visuals on the screen while I talk.
Ooh, no, that's a better picture. This is this is such a sick picture. Ah, Forbes. Whatever. Open image. Okay. Yeah, so this dude right here, Tesla, he understood the world in a different way. He would see the world as vibrations, frequencies, um, pulses. Like you ask um, electrical engineers how electricity works, and they'll say that they know the equations. They know how to, you know, get your power running. They know how to build a magnet with a battery and build a battery with a magnet. But electricity, or like the uh, electromagnetism as a force, or like a substance, like a thing that exists, why it operates the way that it operates, to, to these guys, it's a complete mystery. It just does. It just operates like that. Why? No idea. Just deal with it. You can you can learn everything there is to know about electricity. You could take all the courses that there is, but you could still not have that perspective that Tesla had, the understanding. But Tesla had an intuitive understanding of electricity, like a deep understanding to the point where he didn't need to go out and get an education from someone else. He could hypothesize he could come up with things on his own he was the leader he was the one educating others he didn't have to look anything up he could consider what he knew intuitively about electricity and come up with machines in his own head that couldn't be made with technology at the time and he could understand how they would work and write them all down and later on we'd actually use his concepts and his uh, writings and drawings to actually make those machines and now those machines that we made based off of um, Tesla's writings and his understandings that he couldn't do because of he was limited by the technology of his time. Now those same machines, they help us to do everything from like detect earthquakes to play music through speakers. And both of these things are linked with frequencies and vibrations. Earthquakes and, and music, it's all just vibrations. It just nobody perceives the world as all frequencies. And it's 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 why Tesla's so respected, because of his perspective. Field theory is, is well theories plural. It's another it's another good one like like string theory. And that's the one I really took a liking to at first. I used to imagine not so much anymore. Um, a little bit now, I still have some of this, but I used to imagine the world as this sort of um, foam, jello, aether-like substance, you know, everywhere in three dimensions. And you know how when, you know, jello gets cut inside, inside of it, you, you make some cuts, poke inside jello and stuff like that, you can see the visible cuts inside of it as like, as like parts of jello that are like pressed against each other or like air pockets and things like that. Well, in my imagination, those were the particles that are visible to us. And jello is like the um, gravitational field, the EM field, the Higgs field, uh, strong and nuclear force, all that. It was the, the, it was reality. And it was these little like bubbles in reality that it made but it was, it, I, I could describe it more as like, the way I understood it in my head, it was like areas with greater compression. Like, kind of like compressed gas. Like if there was gas and there were pockets that had more dense areas of gas, and that had particles inside it probabilistically upon observation. And that those those clumps of gas weren't necessarily the particles themselves they were just the mathematical odds of you being able to find the particles somewhere within that cloud right and, and aether is is what i called it that's how i saw it i can't really put it into words that easily it's really hard in order to describe to you the way that i saw the universe 
um, I, I need to give you some context. So, like, let me let me pull up let me pull up some visuals. Let's see. Oh, it's gonna pull up the movie, isn't it? Yeah, no. Uh, I like this picture. So I'll keep this up here. So the, the gravity for me was the big one, okay? For me, I thought to myself, if I could intuitively understand gravity completely, then I can understand everything else. It's a naive thought, but I was a naive kid. So the thing that you understand about gravity is that first of all when your teacher said that it's the attraction between uh objects with mass um she lied it's the attraction between objects with energy uh and and you can if you learn in school you'll learn okay it's over inverse square of the distance between um the said masses if you take Newton's way of doing things, that is. And that's why, you know, the Earth bends light, and that's why we get a lunar eclipse and all that stuff. Because light is energy. Light is massless. Um, so, you know, if, if it was an attraction between objects with mass, light would not be affected. But it is. And the reason why gravity affects physical matter is because matter is just a whole lot of energy just really really compressed uh, like that's Einstein's equation he said E equals mc squared energy equals matter times c aka continuum aka space time continuum aka speed of light squared which means like if you don't know what I'm talking about that means if you take a whole lot of energy like a lot of it like the speed of light times itself of that much energy and you compress it all together you can convert it to matter but only a little bit actually my my whole my whole contribution is actually kind of piggybacking off of einstein here and my contribution isn't actually a scientific one it's it's a it's a it's more of a, a thought experiment it's more like a mind blow one actually so you find different ways to perceive gravity on this like journey, right? And each interpretation needs to take a few things into account. Number one, gravity affects space time. The greater the gravitational force of an object, the greater the warping of space time around it, and the slower time will pass for it, um, as well as things around that, uh, within that warped space time. The more warped it is, I'm, I'm using warped in 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 a way where you just have to understand what i'm saying but the more warped you are an object is inside that um strong gravitational uh, attraction to a massive object the slower it will age basically also with space as a concept we can understand that the quicker you move throughout space the slower time is for you. So let's say you travel close to the speed of light um, and you go all the way from here to another star and your journey takes like uh, 2.5 years, okay? And then you go to that star, you check it out, and then you come back. It takes two, 2.5 years for you to get back. By the time you get back, you'll be five years older, but everyone on Earth will be like 35 years older. Well, I got that one from Brain Pop. Um, I'll never forget hearing that. I'll never forget, like, I remember exactly where I was in the library and everything when I watched that Brain Pop video. And I had to watch it back, like, 20 times just to make sure that Tim really said that. But yeah, no, he really said that. And yeah, it's true. It's, it's not, like, it's, it's relative. Space-time is relative. And it's not your speed, 
it's more like time affects you based on your speed relative to other objects. And, or actually, it, it's more like your speed relative to the constant speed of light um, coming from you and, and being emitted onto you um, by objects observing, by objects observing you and objects you're observing. Um, and in reality, if, if there is no observation happening between objects, like if there was never any humans to observe the universe, um, on, on a grand scale, time doesn't really even exist at that point. The universe is just the universe. Everything is just... Uh, every, it, will, it will reach an end, is what I'm trying to say. And that end is, is kind of predetermined by physics. So the universe is on a set path. And you can look at the universe as just the set path is us in our, in our um, you know, minds right now being able to track uh, things happening on that set path. But that's not an accurate interpretation of what the universe actually is. Time really only exists in our minds. <laughs> So in, 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 more, in more ways than one, without an observer, time doesn't really exist. Actually, not in more ways than one. It is just one way if you really, really um, push yourself. The, the philosophical and the, and the scientific can be combined here. But it's, it's in a way, if you're if you're moving very, very fast, it's not you that's aging slowly. It's just your light is traveling to the people on Earth at a much greater factor than the light is traveling to you, which, when you look at it, actually makes perfect sense. That's not the right way to explain it. Holy shit, this is really hard to explain. Like, if you don't take time to study it and understand it, then what I'm saying actually doesn't make sense. I mean, I was so interested in science as a kid, especially the harder stuff, like what I'm talking about right now, that this is what I did. I would come home, and while my brother would play Halo, I would go upstairs, and I would read the encyclopedia. Only the science pages, though. That shit was so interesting. The only time I ever went out of my way to read a book, it was the damn encyclopedia. But yeah, gravity is intertwined with everything. And that's why we need different clocks in space that run at different speeds uh, than the clocks here on Earth. Because they're experiencing less of Earth's gravity than we are, by a little bit. Um, and so their clocks will actually run a little faster. They're aging faster than us. Not by much. I mean, you'll never notice a difference. Um, in, in a lifetime, you know, you'll never notice a difference. Um, but on a satellite that uses extremely accurate, you know, universal atomic time to create pinpoint accurate uh, GPS coordinates for every phone on Earth, you actually, you kind of need to account for that difference. Otherwise, you'll get some, some serious inconsistencies and in, in, um, distances and, and stuff like that of, of cell phones. Actually, if you think about it, this one was from Minute Physics. Technically, our head is older than our feet because our feet have spent much more time closer to the earth than our head has for most people. Um, so at the end of our lifetime, our feet are maybe uh, fractions of nanoseconds uh, younger than our heads, if even that, you know, but technically they are younger. Technically they didn't age as quickly. <laughs> Oh, and also, like I said, the more gravity exerted, the slower time goes. And also, the closer you are to Earth, the slower time moves for you. Well, when you look at the more extreme things in the universe, like a black hole, the closer and closer you get to a black hole the slower time moves even more all the way until you reach the event horizon at which at which point 
time slows down so much that it stops, like completely. Like physics doesn't apply in a black hole, uh, our, our universe's physics, at least. And what's more is it isn't just gravity that does it. It's the faster an object moves, the more energy it takes for it to move faster. And when it reaches close to the speed of light, small particles can exert the gravitational pull of stars. And when it reaches the speed of light, I mean, that's it. It turns into a black hole. It, there's no anything with mass. I'm talking about particles that are massless. So any particle that is not light going the speed of light will turn into a black hole. In fact, it's, it's been theorized that we make black holes. Like human beings make uh, tiny artificial black holes in particle accelerators. They're too small to be stable. Um, and they barely last long enough to get any useful information out of them, I think. And despite how interesting it sounds, it's actually pretty anticlimactic. Uh, you could make an argument that black holes are being created all the time everywhere and just annihilating themselves. That is, a, that is an argument you can make. Um, it won't hold up, but you could say it on, on the surface and, and you can hold your own for like 30 minutes arguing that against a physicist. <laughs> but yeah, it's, 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 it's theorized. It's not even like sure. And it's not even as interesting as like the normal routine of like just smashing protons together. <laughs> It's kind of just up in the air still. But if you consider what a black hole is, like just in its purest essence, then I'd say it's more likely than not that we've created a few rips and tears here and there. I mean, like there's many interpretations of the universe that predict that particles will eventually decay you know, a quantum quantum decay into a black hole type entity through quantum tunneling, and then that those those particles will decay into nothing but virtual particles. And it's likely that we've you know fucked around with virtual par virtual particles so much in these proton smashers that we may have created a handful of black holes on occasion. But I'm no scientist; I have no idea. But back to my back to my idea. The reason why I'm so fixated on black holes is because when you're at that age and when you're when you're studying this sort of thing, all you really care about is the interesting parts of science, and black holes is one of those interesting parts. So when I'm when I'm coming up with my my theory here, okay, my perception of gravity also has to take into account black holes. And that was the real tricky part for me. Black holes have to make sense in this overarching theory of mine. And also sometimes there's instances where things just like to disobey gravity. Like when things reach extreme temperatures. But that's kind of like, that's not really part of the deal. Actually, it, it is. Like when things get really, really hot, the concept of, of gravity and, and of... of even like time and stuff, it gets so warped that it doesn't even make any sense. Now, the kind of heat needed to make this happen um, is, is, has only been achieved once, ever, and can probably never be achieved again. Maybe in very, very tiny instances, you know, particles at a time on Earth. But in the universe, uh, outside of Earth, it's not happening again. And you can ask questions like, okay, how did this happen? How was there all this heat? How was the entire universe that we can see right now, the observable universe compressed into a size smaller than like, uh, you know, a marble or whatever, whatever people call it now. How long did the Big Bang last? Things, you can ask these kinds of questions but asking a question like, what was the size of the Big Bang, or how long did the Big Bang last, is like, that's like 
that's like asking, that's like how many miles can a computer run? Like a computer program run? Like the sentence grammatically makes sense, right? A compu computer programs run, and you're asking how many miles can a computer program run? But the miles, but like it, grammatically, the sentence structure is correct, but it's counterintuitive. Like we experience this time as like this linear thing. So to imagine time uh, or space time rather as this like flowing, uh, like shifty, like sand in the wind or like uh, jello, you know, expanding and contracting. It's, it's weird and it doesn't make any sense to us because we're human beings and we, um, we're, we evolved to, um, we evolved to look at the earth as flat, basically. So you, if you want to go past these things, you want to transcend, um, human existence and reach the level of uh, godlike intellect, you need to form a new perspective. You need to abandon the, the, a carnal human perspective, basically. And that's why it's so hard to explain this, because it's really hard to to put the words together, if there even are words for it. Like, unless you spend years and years of thinking about this stuff deeply, it doesn't matter what I say, the words won't actually have any meaning. But I'll make an attempt. So, with gravity, okay? By the way, before I continue, I should, I should put a disclaimer here. Um, watch at your own risk, okay? If you are just now learning about all this stuff, you might have nightmares after taking it all in. I'm speaking from experience here, and like seriously, a warning. The nightmares were bad. Like if you're a a kid, um, you know, under under even like sixteen, all right. Don't listen to this. Like, I still think about those nightmares. I don't even know how my brain came up with some of these things. Like, if dreams are random sensory interpretations that, you know, our lizard brain just guesses is happening while our uh, memory is being strengthened and important connections are firing off and getting reinforced and things like that, then what I, what, what I was dreaming about should be random. But these dreams, dude... They were bafflingly horrifying, oddly horrifying. Like, I can't even say, like, some of the dreams were like, it would be night after night, repeatedly, my brother would be eaten alive, or, like, my parents would be drowning. Like, like these nightmares were so stressful and vivid. And, I, of course, I'd wake up in the middle of the night. I'd wake up, immediately stand up, like, run around, um immediately pass out and hit my head um, against like the floor or something like that. This happened multiple times. I, there was even an instance where um, my mom, like my mom, my dad, my brother, like literally saw it happen. I was like freaking out. Uh, I thought like parts of my room were, were morphing and like things have been duplicated and things like that. And I, I like ran to my, my parents and my brother who were watching TV and they were still awake and I was like freaking out telling them what happened. And I thought everything I was saying was sane but um, after I explained it to my mom and then my brother came upstairs, he's like, so what happened? This happened. And he's telling me back what I said. And I'm like, oh my God, I can't believe I said that. I was literally hallucinating. I was straight up hallucinating. And uh, it, was, it was not good. So, yeah. And once I stopped diving into all this like deep science stuff, I stopped getting the nightmares. I can only assume that that's what caused it. It was like really pushing myself like this so watch at your own peril okay disclaimer i'm i'm actually serious about this the real disclaimer this time not playing around but yeah watch at your own risk okay so with gravity so the way i perceived gravity uh was not as a field or as like in emission or an or a force um it was more like just a property just a constant just another um attribute of space-time like 
if light bends when coming close to Earth, it isn't this element of gravity that's pulling it towards Earth. It's more like the mass of Earth bends and warps space-time around it, and the the geodesic curve, or just the light doesn't the light doesn't curve. Light moves in a straight line, so the curve made by the light isn't really a curve at all. It just appears to be a curve from our standpoint. But relative to the photon that's going in a straight line, it's 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 more of a it's it's a special kind of straight line. And in reality, we are the ones that are curving relative to it. That we're we're the ones that are actually curving when light is the observer. When you compare us to light, which light is the only like constant. Speed of light is the only like constant at this scale that you can really uh, use to apply to these laws of physics to um, give you some sort of bearings, you know? So it's um it's funny how you you think about everything that's going on in space time and you try to piece it all together and you eventually come to the conclusion that things only matter well matter is a uh, I don't know if that's the best word but things really only matter things really only like um happen and are worthy of of observation when they're relative to other things. And and you think about that and you're like, oh, relative, relative. That's kind of odd. There's this dude in the 20th century who talked about something like uh, relative, special relative, oh, special relativity. And then, then I started looking into what Einstein had to say. In a way, you could kind of say that like, Everything isn't actually relative. Everything is truly absolute. And it's the like inconsistencies that prop up, like our own our own inconsistencies in observing the universe that prop up due to the speed of light, as well as like actually being observers of objects. Um, the universe can be absolute, but our observation elicits relativity. You could you could say that i wouldn't i wouldn't go down that rabbit hole but you could say that if that makes any sense i'm not good at explaining it if you don't already know what i'm talking about then you aren't actually learning anything like I'm, i i can't i can't really explain this stuff to people i, I would, i'm more like like what i was talking about earlier i'm not teaching anyone i'm just refreshing people who already know Einstein explained it really well, actually. He used a few more words than me. He page books, actually, a few of them, um, which, like, thoroughly explain everything. I can't really teach like that. I could, I could spark up some interest, though, and, you know, maybe uh, direct you to some YouTube videos to watch on it, send you down the rabbit hole. That's what did it for me. I didn't grow up watching, like, Carl Sagan like Neil deGrasse Tyson did. I grew up watching Neil deGrasse Tyson. I grew up watching Tim and Moby. I grew up watching Bill Nye the Science Guy. The OGs, man. But now Bill Nye has become like a like a political propaganda driver. And uh, I think Brain Pop stayed real. Dude, I swear, those videos, those Brain Pop videos are timeless. They need to make more Brain Pop memes. Like, Brain Pop memes could really pop off. Like, you know how, like, everyone, everyone's seen them. There is not enough brain pop. There's occasionally a brain pop meme, but we've all watched them. Like, we can all relate to them. I'm off topic. Um, actually, let me write that down. I want to I wanna make some brain pop memes because I know people will get them and it's super underrated and I could totally start like a huge uh, thing on Instagram because I know the Instagram meme pages really pick up on this stuff. Um, I mean, every place that I've seen brain pop memes so far, I've been on these Instagram meme pages. I guess you can say brain pop memes can really 
pop off. Get it? Get it? Brain pop. I think I'll, um... Yeah, I think I'll leave. Whoa, 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 whoa. Th these are new courses. Games, graphic... Oh, no, gra I thought that was graphic design. Creative coding, yeah, that's new. Mars? This is the space one, right? No, this is the... What? Ah, yes. Classic. Who the hell are these guys? Bro, get these guys out of here. So I guess they have made new episodes since I last watched, because I don't recall ever seeing these guys ever once. But, ooh. Classic. I don't remember seeing this. Uh, so I guess this is the crew, huh? Yeah, screw these people. Only Tim and Moby, bro. Only Tim and Moby. What is brain pop and how can it be used for learning? What a stupid question. Just go on the website and watch it. <laughs> but I'm, I'm really, really off topic. Okay, so... Um, let me make sure I have this written down. Okay, cool, cool, cool. Just making sure. But yeah. So, what was I saying? Okay, relativity. Okay. So relativity is like, okay, if I'm... If I'm driving a car, you can say that my car is moving um, 100 miles per hour across the surface of the earth. Because, you know, I, I'm fucking zooming, bro. I'm always going 100 miles an hour. Um, however, if I'm in the car, I can, from my perspective, I can be like, nah, dude, the earth is just rotating under my wheels of my stationary car. I'm not breaking any, any speed limits here. <laughs> And technically, um, like not according to the law, you know, if if, they, if a police officer clocks you going 100, you can't be like, officer, I'm telling you, bro, speed is relative. But on a, on a technical level, both statements are correct. They're just wrong when you compare them to each other, relatively speaking. And that's where light comes in. Um, and sound, uh, in a different way, I guess, but let's not go there, because, like, a sound barrier, for example, is more of, is less of a, a sound barrier, more of an air mass energy transfer speed barrier. But let's not, okay, imagine I'm on a train, okay? This is the example that everyone uses. A train is moving 100 miles per hour forwards and then i throw a ball 10 miles per hour forwards while i'm on the train and now that ball is moving 110 miles per hour forwards but to me that ball is still just moving 10 miles per hour and the crazy thing is this works on everything except light the, the light does not uh you can't stack um, speed to on, onto light. Light is constant no matter the relative motion of the source. The speed of light is determined by... The speed of light can be influenced um, like a pseudo-influenced by like space-time and, and the particles that, intera it, that it interacts with. Um... But the motion of the object that it gets emitted from or reflected off of, that doesn't affect the speed of light. That only affects the wavelength, um, which actually does affect... W wavelength does have a, have a part to play in this. So if I'm on a train going 100 miles per hour and I shine a flashlight forward, that light is not moving at the speed of light plus 100 miles an hour. It's still just moving at the speed of light. 
so let's let's push it a little bit. Let's say my train starts moving half the speed of light. Or let's say my train starts moving very, very close to the speed of light. Like 99% the speed of light. Well, guess what? When I look back behind me, you know, where the train is going away from, I'm not going to see what's just there. As the light is moving super fast, my eyes will really like my eyes will take in the light but it'll take in the light as it's com- coming to me from a different angle oh this is hard to explain essentially what'll happen is i'll be watching the world in slow motion because i'm moving so far away um and uh, like this like light is hitting my eyes from the area that i just was very very slowly and that's it. That's that's literally it. That's how you time travel. Like if you want to move super fast into the future, all you have to do, like if you want the world to move around you in slow motion, all you have to do to see the world in slow motion is just move really fast. It's crazy, right? How little that makes sense. But like, think about it. If I turned back, I would see the world in slow motion. And everybody else would see me um, in in fast motion, basically. Uh, like, literal, literal fast motion. Um, they probably wouldn't, actually, because of, like, the right shift. That would make me disappear. But you know what I mean. Um, you can go forwards in time really, really, really fast. Um, but you can't go backwards in time. So... When I would get really far away, it would actually feel like a really long time to me. But it would feel like no time at all to everyone else. They would have aged normally. And by normally, I mean much faster than I would age moving close to the speed of lights. Dang, dang, this is... It's relative. It's hard to explain. You have to understand you have to already understand what i'm saying before i before i say it but if you can follow along so like i said i was really interested in the things like black holes and dark matter and stuff and dark matter is too much of an enigma to really explore Black holes, I mean, we literally have pictures of black holes now, too, um, as of the time of this stream. And because space-time bends so much around black hole, because space-time bends so much around a black hole, if you were right next to one and you look to the side, um, like perpendic- like tangent to the black hole, you would see the back of your head because the light from the back of your head would travel around in a circle around the black hole in a near circular orbit to reach your eyes. But that isn't like saying much. You probably actually, if you were to think about it, you probably see everything, like your whole body, like front and back, including your forehead too, which means that Patrick can finally see his forehead without looking in the mirror. But yeah, it's it's so weird to imagine that this is how the universe works. Like the actual enforcer of the law of gravity is light. Like something that you can't feel or 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 hear or taste, something that barely interacts with the world is actually the great regulator preventing us from time traveling just because the speed of light is constant. And the relativity between other objects has counterintuitive impacts on space-time because of this. In reality, it's, you, could, you could say that, but it's not really that light is regulating uh, you know, space-time and gravity. It's more like gravity and space-time are the enforcers of their own laws and light is playing along 
it makes no sense even when it makes sense. And I'm starting to realize just how radically different the universe actually is from the way that people perceive it. I mean, I knew back then that it was very different, but it's not even close. Like, we perceive the universe off of our understanding as humans. Like, for example, we perceive clouds as, like, you know, fluffy, uh, little, like, floating, happy cotton candy puffs that, um, that honestly probably taste pretty good if you, if you reach out and rip a piece off of it. Um, I mean, if you have any imagination, that's what you think. You, you think they're happy and you think that they taste good. And it's a, it's a revelation when you tell a kid that if they grab a cloud, their hand wouldn't actually rip off a piece of this like cotton candy. Their hand would just get wet. And it's a revolution, revelation to a teenager when you show them a time lapse and they realize, oh, clouds are not this these like poofy solid like puffballs. They're like wispy and and uh, unstable. They're like the wind, basically. They're even you can even call them kind of violent, even. They're they're really like loose, you know? And it's just that our perception of time that you know makes us think of that like as babies intuitively think of clouds as something that they're not gets broken. And adults know this at a certain point, right? And adults imagine clouds because of this, they imagine clouds to be extremely light. And, and like weightless basically like the air and it is just like the air they imagine it to be light as a feather and it's another revelation when you tell adults this is one that i really like telling adults because they understand and, and they perceive clouds as being just as light as air it's it's a revolution to a revelation to them when you tell them that the average cloud weighs a million pounds and that it, I'm not talking about like the big sweeping, like blanket thunder clouds. Like I'm talking about the average. Perception is everything in the realm of abstract thinking. And it's really the fun part of, of this whole of this whole game. Like we perceive ourselves as humans, right? We perceive ourselves as human bodies. It's a revelation when you tell kids that they have skeletons inside them like that scary Halloween costume that's actually in us. And it's a revelation when you tell teenagers, um, you know, when they realize that none of our cells are actually alive, that like life and consciousness are, uh, there really is no, it's a very blurred line and that most of our cells actually aren't even our own. It, the majority of the cells that live on, on our body are, the majority of cells that make make up who we are are living on us. They're bacteria, and the, like we are, we're much less a human than we are a mothership for bacteria. And it's a revelation to adults when they realize that we're not even that. Like we're not even, uh, you know, bodies that we can call a mothership. We're just brains. And not even that, we're. Like, the part that we are self-aware of, that's only really, like, the front part of the brain. Like, the very front, maybe even just the front left side of the brain. Like, we're actually many, many creatures combined into one. We're at least two creatures, that's for sure. Left brain and right brain, that's two different organisms. And they're born together in a, in a symbiotic relationship. They're like... They're like two pilots of a plane, right? The, these two separate creatures sit in the cockpit, like co uh, they're, they're co-pilots, like video co-pilot. And they're, they're piloting this bone mech with flesh armor and a waterproof skin suit. That's what we are. Like at our core, we're at least two completely separate and equal, uh, equal is a stretch, but 
I would, I'll, I'll go with that for now. We're two separate organisms controlling this, this robotic mech. In fact, we're probably not even that. Because you can tell these people at any age until they reach a certain uh, level of wisdom where they think about all these things and they consider all these things that intelligence is just a cleverly constructed set of lies. Like... Self-awareness is caused in the brain, but it's not us that we're self-aware of. That's an illusion. Like, biological intelligence is incredibly parsimonious to the point where you can't draw a line to say which creatures are intelligent and which ones aren't. Ravens have been shown to have self-awareness. Um, fungus have been shown to have the ability to literally solve math problems. Like, many plants communicate with other plants using their root systems. And it's not even that you can call any of this intelligence. This is anthropomorphism. This is just relatability. Like, plants being able to have pseudo-social interactions, that's... You can make the argument there's nothing intelligent about that. It's just physics. It's just chemistry is what's going on. But to us, it looks like intelligence because we like to define things as intelligence. And if anything, we're not even humans. We're just reproductive cells. Like, all we are is just sperm cells and egg cells leeching off of this host that we call humans. Or, or you can call it a mothership of bacteria. And... We as, like me, as a, as a bunch of sperm cells, I'm just, just like these other egg cells out there, we're just looking for the ideal candidates to sexually reproduce. That's probably the truest interpretation of what we are. It's all about your perspective on things. And that, in my opinion, is what really makes this game interesting. <laughs> It's weird. It's actually kind of uncomfortable to imagine that. I'm not thinking about that again. But it's it's also uncomfortable to imagine that it's actually light, this like massless particle that doesn't emit other light for us to see, which effectively makes every light particle invisible um, unless that particular light particle happens to reach our eyes. It's really counterintuitive to imagine that... This is the particle that regulates the universe. It's, it's really counterintuitive. Because we can see lasers, actually. But lasers aren't even... That's, that's not... We're, the light from the laser is not what we're seeing. We're actually only seeing light bouncing off of the dust and the air, um, refracting and whatnot, ending up in our eyes. The actual entire laser that stays a part of the laser is completely invisible to us. We see none of it. And this little, like, harmless, invisible thing that completely goes against all of our intuition, our, our, our primal intuition, doesn't even really have any military application in lasers for that matter, at this point at least. And, and even physicists don't even... Half the time, they won't even call light a particle. It's so weird to imagine that this is the great mediator of gravity and speed and energy and space-time and acceleration and all this stuff. And there's an experiment you can do, actually. Remember how I said earlier that if you're traveling really fast, then time will slow down for you? And also, if you have... a uh, a massive object near you, or you are a massive object, then, like your mom, then time also slows down. Well, you can actually test this, kind of. Um, not really. <laughs> okay, let's say you get in a rocket, okay? Uh, you, okay, you can't test this, but you know what I mean. Let's say you get in a rocket, and you stick a laser pointer to, uh, onto the side of the wall, perpendicular to the ground, or parallel to the ground, perpendicular to the wall, facing the other wall, okay? And it's going to hit the same point on the wall 
um, that's, that's on the other side at the same height above the ground. It's completely, it's 90 degree perpendicular to the wall. What happens if you start moving up? Okay? You start going up really, really fast. Well, light is not instantaneous at traveling. Light takes some time. It's really fast, but it's not instant. So by the time the light reaches the other side, if you are moving up, it will be lower than where it started relative to the rocket. Like if you were to take the, the laser and shine on the light when it's stationary on the ground and mark where the light is, and then you boost um, the rocket to half the speed of light, it'll, it'll end up significantly closer to the ground um, in a different spot than, than where it was before. And, well, relative to the rocket, not relative to the rocket, relative to the rocket. I'm speaking in relative terms. So if you think about it, from our perspective inside the rocket, the light just curved. Like, that's what it just did. Light doesn't curve, but it just did. We saw it with our own eyes. And saw, well, we observed it. We can uh, think about it in a thought experiment. And just as light curves around a massive body like your mom, because mass and acceleration actually do the same thing to space-time, they make light move through it. So they, they bend or distort it, depending on how you like to perceive it um, and what words you like to use. And again, none of this is like set in stone that I'm saying here. All this is up for grabs. Perceive it however you want. Um, there really is no one right answer. There's plenty of wrong answers, but there's no one right answer. Crazy as it sounds when you're talking about physics, right? Okay, everything has to have one right answer. And to be clear, from my perspective, it isn't light that arbitrates the laws of physics. It's just that constant. It's just the speed of light, that number, that 300 million meters per second. It just so happens that light, being a massless particle, um, got caught in my crossfire when I was a kid. It was a, it was it was frustrating. I was attributing, and even now I'm still I'm still attributing cause and effect to things that I really have no proof that are actually cause and effect. But when I was a kid, I was really it would it would irritate me whenever I'd be wrong about these things, because, like, I remember one day I was out here thinking I was out here talking to this dude, and he was telling me about how all these religions are talking about how like. Um, they talk about how God is the light and stuff like that and how heaven is the light. And I was thinking one day, I was like, damn, maybe they have a point after all because light controls everything else. That didn't last long though because I don't believe that light controls everything else. It just it just so happened to end up in that position. It's just correlative. I only thought that way for like a month or so. But it's an interesting perspective to think about. It's not valueless by any means. Um... And it's not that it's wrong, it's just that eventually everyone learns, well, like everyone who's educated, learns to perceive space and time as the same thing, or at least joined by the hip. In reality, the way to look at things is actually to see space and time and gravity and acceleration and mass and energy, speed of light, um, all of this stuff all as just one property of nature. Everything is just nature. It's just physics. And that is actually just step one in the many steps of creating a universal theory of everything. And I was also super fascinated with like negative energy, or as like the normies called it, exotic matter, which is really fucking stupid. Like, Stable wormholes in space and white holes? Give me a break, dude. I didn't know any better, though. I didn't realize that these adult scientists were actually just as childish as me when I was a kid. And um, out of frustration, a lot of these adults would... Not, not the guys who were actually on the cutting edge, but a lot of these adults who were, like, educating people would... would they'd be like, well... How can we do this thing that's like seemingly impossible for the purposes of clickbait, basically? 
Uh, yeah, I just got some negative energy. That ought to do the trick. Exotic matter. Let's call it exotic matter because that's easier for people to understand, for the normies to understand. And then these guys would just slap it onto any plot hole in reality like some flex tape and just hope it all stuck together. Bro, that shit was exotic matter. The way that scientists used to describe it, it's literally like more useful than vibranium from Black Panther. Remember that shit? Like if somebody, if somebody went like, wait, how is this like see-through windshield that is clearly not made of metal absolutely bulletproof? Oh, the vibranium. Wait, how do you have holograms? Oh, you know, vibranium. Wait, how do you have all this medical technology that can cure like any ailment? And don't tell me it's some random fucking metal that is canonically no more useful than adamantium. And there, uh, do I even gotta say it? Motherfuckers had Wakanda privilege, bro. Like, give me some of that vibranium. It might as well be exotic matter with all the shit that they can do. And like, there is some evidence to suggest that there are things out there that we observe in the universe that we go like, oh yeah, there's, uh, you know, there's another thing, uh, maybe another kind of matter that we can't interact with just yet. Um, it just, exotic matter is not like a, uh, I find that a lot of people use it, a lot of people use it as like a foolish little placeholder for the mysteries of the universe, for things like, oh, this doesn't seem to uh, follow gravity in the same way that, like, and people, instead of actually looking into clearing it up in some way, they just slap the exotic matter label onto it. Yeah, it's, it's tough to put myself in the mindset of back then. I was angry, actually. But, yeah, I had no, I, I don't know, I was a little kid. If I were to, if I were to sum up my thoughts on this, it's like, Nikola Tesla said to look at the universe as being made up of frequencies. I posit that you should, um, or rather you could look at the world as being made up of straight lines colliding with other straight lines in the curved, warped, aether jello of space-time. Straight line, space-time. I got straight rhymes. Although, that says absolutely nothing. And geodesic is the word for it. I did say that earlier, I believe. But it's like... Okay, how do I explain this without a webcam? Okay, let's say I'm really, really far from you, okay? And I'm... I'm six feet tall. I, I am six feet tall. But, um, due to the curvature of Earth, from your perspective, if I'm really, really tall from you, I will actually appear lower, and thus, I will look like I'm shorter than six feet tall. That's why ships on the horizon look like they're sinking, because, um, they're actually literally lower from our perspective. The bottom part gets cut off, um, and that's also why, like, Blue Hour aka civil twilight is a thing but imagine like space space itself as curved like the earth like a sphere not a 3d but more like a 4d sphere and then you start to enter the realm of understanding the flow of space time and the force of gravity on objects in a much more intuitive way that's actually a lot more accurate um than our initial understanding of it from adolescence. <laughs> Curved lines are acceleration. Straight lines are not acceleration. That's the way I saw it. Like cuts in jello. Like curved lines are massive bodies with a lot of gravity. And so if you send a straight line through a curved path, the straight line will appear curved and even though it's actually, from its per own perspective, it's straight. But you can actually straighten that curved line back out. If you curve it, that is. You correct for, for that. In a way, you can imagine all 
paths of all particles, uh, the easiest one to imagine would be photons, but you can imagine all paths of all particles to be straight, but kind of like they're moving on a slanted, like NASCAR track kind of path, right? Or maybe like um, a wheelchair that's moving straight, but one of the wheels is on a path with more friction um, or something like that. Or one of the wheels is being, is on, um, you know, those like uh, things on like in the airport where you can walk on them and they're like boosts, they're like Mario Kart boosts. Um, so like one wheel is on that and the other wheel is on, is, is normally moving. Um, and so if you push both wheels equally, it'll actually turn, not because you're turning the wheelchair, but because you're on a curved path. So in that situation, you actually can't push the wheelchair straight without accelerating the, um, the curvature the, without applying pressure, more pressure to one side than the other, if you're pushing the wheelchair. And in that way, time, time and space could be sort of like the, the, the sand and the quicksand, the loose and shifty aether that alters the pathway of light. Not gravity, but the passage of time. And gravity is inexorably linked with the uh, passage of time. But the passage of time, I think, is a cooler way to look at it. Um, maybe better? I don't know. But cooler, for sure. And when you look at it that way, the apparent change in direction is just the shift in its own interaction or movement through time. Maybe gravity is actually irrelevant in all this. I mean, gravity isn't even included in the standard model. That, that's not saying much. People think it should be included. People are really, really hoping to find a graviton or something like that to put in the standard model. Um, so it's not like gravity's irrelevant. But maybe I'm overestimating the relevance of gravity. Maybe my, my uh, strategy when I was little isn't all that optimal of a strategy to try to understand gravity intuitively to understand everything else after that. Oh, and I think I have to also touch on four dimensions. Because don't forget, this theory of everything has to be able to include all the dimensions, spatial and etc. Okay, so this one's going to be tricky. Okay, so how do you perceive the world in four dimensions? Okay, the universe can be in four dimensions. Cool. How can you perceive that, though? Actually, I learned this one from the Carl Sagan video. That fucking mad lad managed to explain four dimensions in a way that I could only understand. Explaining it would be a futile task for me. This dude's a fucking role model, actually, when I think about it. Hold up, let me, let me look for the video. Uh, honestly, it would, better, it would be better for me to just have Carl Sagan explain it to you. Uh, I was watching this video on, on Morbius. Like, it was like a, um, how to prevent the how to prevent the internet from bullying your movie um wait i'm gonna look for it on here Okay, so this is it right here. Wait, hold up. Is this actually it? Cause I think, no, no, this is, this is okay. Yeah, there's different versions of this, but how long is this? 
11? Okay, this should be it. Oh, jeez. Discussing the large-scale structure of the cosmos, astronomers sometimes say that space is curved. Or that the universe is uh, finite but unbounded. Whatever are they talking about? Let's imagine that we are perfectly flat. I mean absolutely flat. And that we live, appropriately enough, in a flat land. A land designed and named by Edwin Abbott, a Shakespearean scholar who lived in Victorian England. Everybody in flat land is, of course, exceptionally flat. We have squares, circles, triangles, and we all scurry about, and we can go into our houses and do our flat business now so everyone everyone following along right it's a two-dimensional universe that we're living in right now we have width and length but no height at all now these little cutouts have some little height but let's ignore that let's imagine that these are absolutely flat. i just opened that a bottle that case. wasn't we know us flatlanders about left right we know about forward, back, but we have never heard of up, down. Let us imagine that. Bro, I wanna, I wanna play this, this dude. That's crazy. Hold up. Uh, it was, it was. There's the Sethical video, bro. I gotta play this before, before we continue. This will really teach you, bro. This will really, really teach you. Um, which one is it? Which one is it? Oh, okay. Here it is. It's the Supreme Court, I believe. All right, so let's go through your charges, okay? Robbery. Wait. Is this it? Yeah, yeah, this is it. This is it. Simply put, didn't do that shit. I mean... <laughs> what a way to... What a defense, bro. Saul Goodman, take notes. He might have got a speeding ticket, but that's it. If he murdered three people, where's the bodies? Bro, why are they trying all of these at the same time? Why are they trying three murders and they're also throwing in a speeding ticket? Like, what's the speeding ticket going to do? Where's the weapons? Y'all have zero evidence to convict him. Dog, you are the worst attorney I've ever had. You ain't talking about shit up there. Oh, you want- that's, that's a reasonable defense. What is he talking about? Wanna come up here and testify? You already got a f- This is- Dude, after- After, like, watching a lot of, like, court stuff, this is hilarious to see. Like, oh, you wanna come up here and testify? As if- As if your lawyer would, like, turn on you like that? in that jail cell shit i'm good order in the motherfucking court is the defense done talking that bullshit yes your honor all right prosecution start calling up some witnesses prosecution calls young cash register to the stand oh i'm about to get it so tell me about yourself mr register you already know who the fuck i am grammy award winner for my <laughs> single gone quadruple he's getting this plug in platinum swept up by young cash register aka little broomstick that's Bro, that's actually genius. Like, I wanna, I wanna go testify at court at some like huge thing, and I'm be like, "Hey, yo, shout out to my single. Check out my single. Check out my album. I'm I like, give myself a huge plug like that. What a, what a great way to promote." Song went fucking dummy. Do you have any personal connection to the defendant? Yeah, that's my boy. And let me tell you something. He did that shit. <laughs> Guilty as fuck. What the <laughs> fuck? Motherfuckers really ain't got no loyalty. Fuck you mean no loyalty. I gotta just go and go up there. Yo, can you shut the fuck up? Bruh, he up there rapping that bullshit. You know what? I got some shit to say. Do not go up there and testify. You're the defendant. Don't <laughs> say shit. Fuck it. Hey, call me up to the stand. This motherfucker going to jail. Mr. Baku. I'm turning it down. What shoes were you wearing on the day you were arrested? Pair of Yeezys. You mean these?
Yeah, What's the them point? is my fucking shoes. Oh, he guilty. Guilty. He did that guilty, shit. Guilty, guilty, guilty. The fuck y'all talking about guilty? Oh, he did that shit. I'll stomp one of y'all bitches out. How you gonna stomp a motherfucker out with a pair of Yeezys? You need to put on some Tims. That's real shit. Objection. Huh? He's speaking facts. Objection. What the fuck? Objection. He's speaking facts. These Yeezy Boost 350s indicate guilt. Objection. He on that bull, your honor. How are my client's shoes relevant to the case? All he wears is Yeezys. Okay, you said all he wears <laughs> is Yeezys. The suspect in each of the murders was described as being fitted the fuck out, head to toe, <laughs> in some damn Yeezy. Bro, bro. This dude is like the biggest Kanye stan ever. He never misses an opportunity to like shout out Kanye in some way, bro. Look at that jacket. That's Yeezy season two. Clearly, he's guilty. I don't see how his fit matters at all. Y'all really gonna lock this man up over some damn Yeezys? I'm gonna keep it real, y'all. I ain't ever really fuck with Kanye. <laughs> That's real shit. 100. Oh, fuck. He's speaking facts. You right. That's true. Dog, I'm going to fucking jail. Can I get a new lawyer? By the end of the night, you gonna be behind bars. Trust. Prosecution calls Obito to the stand. Finally. So do you have any personal connection to the defendant? Nah, I just work at Popeyes. Do you know anything about the missing people? I know where the motherfuckers are. Is that right? They're not dead. They're in a higher dimension. Another dimension. Oh, no sense. Yeah, this is this is the part you gotta pay attention to. This is so fucking genius. It's How do you know that? The third dimension. What are you talking about? Third dimension? There's no third dimension. Where'd she he go? Wait a minute. What the fuck? She. Hey, what the fuck? Wait, I killed that motherfucker. How is that possible? Oh, he guilty. You going to jail you now? You dumb fuck. So you just went to the third dimension and got him? Yeah, I teleported. Look, let me explain how it works. We live in a two-dimensional world. Up, down, left, and right. But what about forward and backward? What is that? What the fuck did he say? <laughs> this is the same shit that Carl Sagan said. Never wonders about left, right. And we know about forward, back. But we have never heard of up, down. Let us imagine. We've never heard of that. Imagine going and telling them, oh yeah, what about up and down? What the fuck is that, bro? What are you talking about? It's the same, same energy, bro. That into flat line. Hovering above it comes a strange three-dimensional creature, which, oddly enough, looks like an apple. And the three-dimensional creature sees uh, an attractive, congenial-looking square, watches it enter its house, and decides in a gesture of interdimensional amity to say hello. Hello, says the three-dimensional creature. How are you? I am a visitor from the third dimension. Well, the poor square looks around his closed house, sees no one there, and what's more, has... This is actually how... This is a... Some people say this is how we hallucinate. Because when we take psychedelics... Well, okay, okay, I'll, I'll continue. Witnessed a greeting coming from his insides, a voice from within. He surely is getting a little worried about his sanity. The three-dimensional creature is unhappy about being considered a psychological aberration, and so he descends to actually enter Flatland. Now, a three-dimensional creature exists in Flatland only partially, only a plane, a cross-section through him can be seen. So. When the three-dimensional creature first reaches Flatland, it's only the points of contact which can be seen. And we'll represent that by stamping the apple in this ink pad and placing that image in Flatland. And as the apple were to descend through, slither by Flatland, we would progressively see higher and higher slices, which we can represent by the apple. So the square, as time goes on, <laughs> yeah. sees a set of objects. The ink didn't attach to the from nowhere and inside a closed room and change their shape dramatically.
What the? What is this? What the? What the hell is going on? Okay. We by being considered a psychological low and sends our flat creep objects mysteriously appear from nowhere and inside a closed room and change their shape dramatically. His only conclusion could be that he's gone bonkers. Well, the apple might be a little annoyed at this conclusion and so not such a friendly gesture from dimension to dimension makes a contact with the square from below and sends our flat creature fluttering and spinning above flatland. At first the square has no idea of what's happening. He's terribly confused. This is utterly outside his experience. But after a while he comes to realize that he is seeing inside closed rooms in flatland. He is looking inside his fellow flat creatures. He is seeing Flatland from a perspective no one has ever seen it before, to his knowledge. Getting into another dimension provides as an incidental benefit a kind of X-ray vision. Now our flat creature slowly descends to the surface, and his friends rush up to see him. From their point of view, he has mysteriously appeared from nowhere. He hasn't walked from somewhere else. He's come from some other place. They say, for heaven's sake, what's happened to you? And the poor square has to say, well, I was in some other mystic dimension. It's crazy because let's say the apple were to try to communicate and try to tell you things. That's actually a theory that I've heard about schizophrenia, that it's these other dimensional beings communicating with you that um, are targeting their communication directly at you, but that live in higher dimensions. And then there is this whole idea of psychedelic experiences um, really, really enforcing this idea of higher dimensions um, and like this idea of like the soul and stuff like that. Because like he said, the apple appears like a cross section, right? It, it cannot fully, like you can't take the apple and make it fully visible in two-dimensional world. It can't be represented as such. So you can only see 3D cross-sections of four-dimensional beings. So if the if you call upon this four-dimensional being to show you the truth of the world, and they say, okay, I'm gonna lift you up in the air, like how the apple did to that piece of paper, you see things that are far beyond anything you could ever explain. You come back down to the world, you tell everyone your experience, and some people say that that's how we hallucinate and that's why and that's how people who haven't experienced it don't believe it people who have experienced it all report the same thing and when people take psychedelics that it always people always report it as appearing like a world of a higher dimension like a higher dimension of hyper beings communicating with us that's what all the people report it as it's like it's like if we take these people on their word and we imagine that it's true then there are these, the, these, these psychedelics that uh, send out a signal into the higher dimensions, um, maybe not into the higher dimensions, but that allow the higher dimensional beings to view that signal that uh, uh, elicit them to let us access different dimensions. Um, or maybe uh, it's just like a... a, a a trigger for um, our minds to push ourselves into like for the, the, the soul and stuff like that because from the perspective of the other flatland creatures um, that person disappeared and reappeared out of thin air they teleport basically but we don't see that in real life you know if somebody takes ayahuasca every, he's still sitting there he's still on <laughs> but he imagines himself to be teleported somewhere else, and that's how people come up with the idea of the soul. And I think that's why the soul is such a such a popular idea in religion, because 
religion in large part comes from the the symbiotic uh, mental relationship that we have with these drugs. Um, so it's not it's not a stretch to say that the soul comes from the fact that people are imagining them as as their their true self, their inner self, as being different from their physical body in like a dualist and and dualist sort of way, you know. If you listen to people who take psilocybin in particular, their experiences are really like eerily similar to what's happening here. But yeah, it's I and mean, then there's also like people who get hypnotized, and then uh, there is that schizo theory that I, I mentioned. Um, I think it's it's cool to think about, like, as if there's some sort of conscious like parasite that's attached to your body, uh, and that only the cross section is there in your mind, but it actually exists in in a in a higher dimension on like a fourth dimensional axis. Um, but all of this seems like a bit of a stretch, uh, with with psychedelics in particular. But I mean, like I said, everything here is up for grabs. Like, who knows for sure? The schizo one seems a bit too convenient to fit. And there's a lot of things that make people have voices in their heads, not just schizophrenia. Um, but yeah, it doesn't, it also doesn't account for a lot of things. But like the, the, the fungal intelligence theories combined with higher dimensional beings is actually really, really compelling. And it leads to a lot of strange coincidences. Called up. And they will pat him on his side and comfort him, or else they'll ask, well, show us, where is that three dimen third dimension? Point to it. And the poor square will be unable to comply. But maybe more interesting is the other direction in dimensionality. What about the fourth dimension? Now, to approach that, let's consider a cube. We can imagine a cube in the following way. You take a line segment and move it at right angles to itself an equal length. That makes a square. Move that square an equal length at right angles to itself, and you have a cube. Now, this cube, we understand, um, casts a shadow. And a cross section. That shadow we recognize it's you know ordinarily drawn in uh, third grade classrooms as two squares with their vertices connected now if we look at the shadow of a three-dimensional object in two dimensions we see that in this case not all the lines appear equal not all the angles are right angles the three-dimensional object has not been perfectly represented in its projection in two dimensions but that's part of the cost of losing a dimension in the projection. Now, let's take this three-dimensional cube and project it, carry it, to a fourth physical dimension. Not that way, not that way, not that way, but at right angles to those three directions. I can't show you what direction that is, but imagine that... So, it's actually really interesting because this is the easiest, even though it is difficult, this is the easiest way, in my opinion, to actually visualize a four-dimensional... This is a, a, the easiest way to get your start in visualizing it. Visualizing a four-dimensional sphere, I think, is easier, but it's harder to understand if that's your first thing that you have to visualize. If you can visualize this um, in four dimensions, a tesseract, a four-dimensional hypercube, then it, it's effortless to understand what a four-dimensional sphere would look like. But... What he's basically saying is, if, um, let's say you have a square, right? Well, what's the properties of a square? All of the sides have to be equal in length, and all of the angles have to be 90 degree angles. So if you um, were to extend it out, create more right angles to fill the entire three-dimensional space, um, all the sides, once again, all 12 sides... Yeah, 12 sides, and all, I, I don't know, eight, um, eight vertices have to be 90, well, 90 degrees, 90 degrees, 90 degrees, and then 90 degrees, 90 degrees, 90 degrees. So, it, but all of the vertices between all the lines have to be 90 degrees, 
and all of the sides have to be equal in length. So what he's saying is, if you want to create a four-dimensional cube, you want to go from two dimensions, three, three dimensions, you want to go from three dimensions to four dimensions, you have to extend each one of these vertices outwards at a 90 degree angle, which is impossible without intersecting these lines in three dimensions. But you have to send it out at 90 degrees and they all have to be the same uh, length. So if you extend a line out here, let's just say you extend it out somehow and you get it to be 90 degrees, okay? And then you extend this line out, or then you extend this line out 90 degrees, and then you connect the lines, and you have a new line right here. This line that you made that's new has to be the same length as this line and this line. It, it has to be the same length. And when you look at the shadow from earlier, if you pay attention, this is not a 90 degree angle. This is an obtuse angle. This is another obtuse angle. This is another, like, and this is an acute angle. And this is an acute angle. And you look at the differences in, in distances and things like that. Like, even though this isn't, this, this is very close to the, to the thing, so the shadow won't be um, exactly all that uh, intuitively understood to be different, but these are different uh, distances. Like, this line is obviously very, very short compared to this line or this line, you know? So... You make these compromises and you imagine in your own head, there's no way for me to really explain it deeply, um, to really get you to understand it. You just have to think and think and think and eventually you'll get it. Um, you know what really helped me to visualize four dimensions? DMT. No, I'm playing. Um, I've never done any of that stuff. But you guys know about those toys where there's like a box of 3D shapes and you have to put them in inside the box, like back in the box using 3D, uh, 2D cutouts of it, like cross sections of it. That really, uh, I we used to play with that at the dentist office when I was really little. And that gave me like a really strong understanding on like how to translate objects um, from 3D into, into a 2D cross section or like a shadow. I remember uh, at the dentist one time, like I was supposed to, we were supposed to believe like we were done and I was there with my mom and I must've been like five or six years old and I found that thing and I was just playing with it for like an hour. I mean, okay, you, I was a kid, so time perception is off. It felt like an hour to me, but we probably, and my mom was like, let's leave, let's leave, let's go. And I was like, no, I want to play with this for a little longer. And I was just so, so excited from, from like learning that. And if I didn't do that, I probably wouldn't have been able to really visualize four dimensions the way I've been able to in the past. But nowadays, it's not so much anymore nowadays. And even then, even when I was able to visualize it at, at, the, at the peak of my, like, um, of, of when I was really deep into uh, physics and four dimensions and all this uh, deep abstract science, it was only more like fleeting hints on how a four-dimensional sphere would um, operate moving through a three-dimensional world, you know? Like, that's really all it was. It's, it's, still, it's still nearly impossible, I think. Um, I don't think it's impossible. I think it's very, very difficult to actually visualize a four-dimensional universe. Um, I think maybe psychedelics might give you a, a bit of a bit of assistance from nature but yeah i think it's possible i just never really went too deep into it but i did visualize quite a bit but i just want to make sure you have a basic understanding of um four dimensions like a four dimensional universe before i continue so our universe is four dimensions okay well, is it actually kind of? Not really. Um, it actually kind of depends on your interpretation. I always liked to imagine the universe as a four-dimensional sphere that we exist on one of the cross-sections of in three dimensions, and that our sphere is our observable universe. Because if, if the light of something has, has yet to reach you, it actually doesn't really even exist, if you think about it. Because 
gravitational waves travel at the speed of light, which means space-time has yet to send the signal that, hey, this thing exists, so make sure your uh, movements and all that stuff are influenced by it. It has yet to send that signal to us from that thing that's very, very far away. So not only has the light not reached us, the gravity of that object is, n is not doesn't have any influence on the uh, object that, you know, on us or any other object. So if something is outside the observable universe, it basically doesn't exist. The observable universe is our universe in all, in all senses of the word. There is no way for us to ever look at anything outside the observable universe. I mean, it'll, the observable universe will continue to grow, probably, maybe not for long, but anything outside of what we can observe uh, the, the light of doesn't exist for all intents and purposes. <laughs> or maybe it doesn't exist yet. Which is actually, oh, that's such a brilliant way to think about it because it hasn't happened yet because the light hasn't reached us. So yeah, 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 it doesn't exist yet. It's still waiting to come into existence. Damn. And from their perspective, we are still waiting to come into existence. Which is why I say that time doesn't exist. Because from our perspective, we're in this thing and, you know, we're on this path of time. But if you look at time in a grand scale, we don't exist. And we also do exist. So, yeah, time only exists in our minds. But I, I just thought I'd, I thought I'd show you this video. So, yeah, damn, this is actually tough. I don't like this contribution, bro. I want to get this one over with. Okay. So, what the hell was I saying? I got to write notes, bro. I have bullet points. I have bullet points that I'm looking at, but um, I don't write that many bullet points. I should write more. Okay, I'm going to write bullet points now. Um, what was I talking about? What was I talking about? Um, damn, I'm trying to think. It was important. I had something to say. Let me... Part of the cost of losing a dimension in the projection. Now, let's take this three-dimensional... Okay, okay. So, when it comes to, to when it comes to uh, understanding the world in, in a four-dimensional, if you, if you choose to perceive the world in that way, um, I actually like to perceive the world in that way. I think it's kind of cool. Um, also, I can't imagine that the whole like cosmological principle that Einstein talked about would work um, in, in the same way that we observe it if we just lived in, in this very limited three-dimensional world. Like the idea that there is no center to the universe, I've always had a sneaking suspicion that I could never shake off like, how is everywhere the center of the universe? And if so, why doesn't that automatically make us the like uh two-dimensional fleas uh trapped on the surface of an expanding soap bubble type of uh three dimensions you know analogous to me that that really is the only way that sort of thing makes sense i really don't have an answer for that actually maybe maybe i'm being stupid right now i'm just talking nonsense but I, and I never looked at any of the math of, of any of this stuff. Maybe the math totally checks out and cosmological principle and all this stuff and it all, everything, the whole universe is three-dimensional, right? And we have no evidence of a fourth dimension. I know we have no evidence of a fourth dimension. I know that. Um, but I'm skeptical. I'm skeptical of that. I'm not skeptical in general, but I'm skeptical of that. If I were a betting man, like if, if, if a god were to ascend from the heavens, put a gun to my head and say, okay, take your best guess, uh, three dimensions or four dimensions, I'd say the universe has at least four. According to string theory, the universe is 11, but we can only operate in three, uh, spatially. And <clears throat> on the quantum scale, particles have no issues interacting with 11. So... 
Uh, how can I explain this? Actually, I got this. With 11 dimensions, let's take the example of flat land that, that Carl Sagan gave us, okay? Actually, he didn't give it. It was from a book. But he explained it really well. Um, so let's say we have uh, an arc, okay? An arc, a bent wire, basically. And it's, it's, it's floating around in, in three-dimensional space, okay? So we have this arc, and it's just like, just like floating around, spinning, whatever, right? And let's say there's this cross-section on, on uh, two-dimensional, on flat land, okay? And it's poking through it. It's poking through this piece of paper. Then what'll happen is from an outside observer, they look at this. What they'll see is a particle. They'll see a tiny little a dot, a dot of a particle. And they'll see it moving around in really weird ways. They'll see it start to uh, uh, go forward and backward and uh, left and right. And they'll see it accelerate and decelerate and stop and do all this stuff. And you can look at, you can imagine that in higher dimensions, there's a whole bunch of these arcs or, you know, strings and, and entangled stuff. And um, that when you combine all these things, it, it, it all looks normal and it follows the laws of physics that we, we like Newton's laws and things like that. Um, the issue is when you look at just one tiny particle, it always appears to move in ways that makes no sense. And this arc on flat land, they won't know it's an arc. They won't really know what it is. It'll appear to be a particle that can change directions at random without being uh, um, interacted on by an outside force. Well, not actually, not really at random because we can actually measure um, what it does and figure out uh, the random movements of it. We can, we can observe a particle enough times and actually determine the probability that we have like these probabilistic like fields of electrons and things like that. Like we, we have them all actually mapped out. And um, this, this randomness actually appears quite a bit in nature. And when you take a closer look, it's actually not random at all. Um, these things follow very, very uh, strict probabilistic guidelines. And let's say this, let's say on this piece of paper, on this flat land, this arc, right, that's poking through it. Sometimes while it's like wiggling around, it's like, it's wonky. Sometimes it'll just like pop off the piece of paper and it'll go only into this dimension and it won't touch flat land. Well, then from the perspective of the people in flat land, that particle just disappeared. And then maybe it can reappear somewhere else. It just teleported. Or sometimes if the arc will get really close to the paper, like if it's like a curved arc and it'll get really close, and then both of the ends of it are cutting through, they're intersecting the page, That in that way you'll have the same particle, identical, intertwined, literally the same particle with the exact same properties, same charge, same spin, same everything, in two places at once. Like, when, when, when these uh, physicists talk about like, oh, you can have particles that appear in two places at once. That's how. Like, this is, this is how it is. This is how it's done. And we see this stuff. We literally see these things happen. At a, well, not like see, see them, but like, at a quantum level, our observations of the universe uh, tell us that there's more going on here than um, three-dimensional, than if you were to apply the laws that we know about the three-dimensional universe, then it doesn't work anymore. So there must be higher dimensions or the laws we are using must be wrong, like the law of like um, conservation of momentum and things like that. Those must, they, they cannot be correct. Either that or there are higher dimensions. And that's what these the quantum observations are sort of telling us, the, like probabilistic, like not necessarily cause and effect, but these observations, they tell us that maybe there's this sort of 
potentially a potential way to think about it would be like all these particles are sort of instead of being particles they're more like a 11 dimensional like ramen noodle mush everywhere and everything is intertwined with everything else and the the, the four dimensional intertwining is actually the whole reason why particles interact to begin with and so we do the math right not we like a lot of people smarter than me they go like okay could this work in four dimensions right and they go yeah this could work in four dimensions and then they go well could it work in five dimensions and they write the math for five dimensions um they follow all the consistent logic like how i mentioned how everything has to be 90 degrees and same length they just scale up the math to five dimensions and they go well the particles uh they they seem to still work if you talk about this um being a, a, a mush of strings in five dimensions and six and seven and, and they keep going up and uh when i was a kid actually around this time and string theory was really popping off um and the string theory wikipedia page was being updated like every day uh it was actually well known that there were nine spatial dimensions and one time dimension possibly two but that's only that's only a gift from scientists to storytellers so that they can take it and run with it and make movies like Interstellar. But yeah, 2013, 2014, that was around the time where people thought, okay, yeah, nine spatial dimensions. I don't know if you guys remember that. Um, nine spatial, that was a huge, huge thing. Um, but that was also when I stopped studying this stuff. Now, apparently, there's 11. Um, so I guess they worked out the math for 11. And I believe people have tried to run the math in 12 dimensions, and it just, it isn't stable, it doesn't work anymore. So 11 seems to be the largest number of possible spatial dimensions that quantum particles can interact with in. Um, so I guess they're just immediately coming to the conclusion, yeah, if they can interact in 11 dimensions, then they are interacting in 11 dimensions, which if that's... It, if at that scale there's nothing stopping them from interacting with higher dimensions, sure, why not? What's the difference between jumping from three to four from and then and then four to eleven, right? It, whether or not there actually is a major difference is in the eye of the beholder, actually. Like some people would say that it's 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 a huge difference and you need to um account for each one and if if it can make sense in a lower dimension then you don't just immediately jump to higher ones. But some people would say that um, particles uh, particles that may actually just be one-dimensional, like uh, particles that are interpreted by the universe to be three-dimensional, um, but are not actually three-dimensional, if they can interact with four, they can interact with 11, and it isn't that big of a deal. There shouldn't be anything stopping them. It really is in the eye of the beholder, actually. But... I never actually under, like to like to imagine time as a dimension. I always understood that time and space um, were the same. Not like always, not when I was a little kid, obviously. But I never, I never called time a dimension the way I called, you know, length, height, and width dimensions. In fact, imagining time as a dimension could actually be a hindrance, if you think about it. Like... Mo almost everyone considers time to be a fourth dimension, right? One that we can travel through, um, like in Back to the Future, and how if we can travel through time, um, it would appear as, like, that that time dimension would appear as space for ourselves uh, if we were, like, four-dimensional hyper-beings, um, and that they could time travel, basically. But... For three-dimensional beings, it would appear as just like passing of time. But it's also possible that time is simply an emergent property of lots and lots and lots of quantum entanglement. And that everything is predetermined by physics. That the beginning of time and the end of time are set in stone. And the passage of time is simply the the universe dreaming creating life in its own image contemplating its own existence in this dream in a, in a deep deep sleep of entropy that it will never wake up from most likely 
But honestly, I don't want to open up that can of worms today. And besides, I haven't actually, like, done any real research on entanglement. And actually, honestly, entanglement isn't even all that relevant. The amount or, or volume of entangled particles probably doesn't correlate to overall entropy in a system. Wait, no. The intrusive thoughts are winning again. The naive thoughts... Ah, uh, fuck it. So, this is the this is the interpretation that we're going with right now. Okay, <clears throat> based on this, it could be more beneficial to view the fourth dimension not as time, but as an emergence of entropy in every system or every action reaction. <laughs> Just talking about this, like, reminds me about, like, politicians. I don't know why, but, like, politicians talk about topics that they know nothing about. And and they assume that if an expert explains it to a jury or whatever, that they'll understand it. With just, like, a few words. And words are limited. Like, it, like I'm th- talking about all this stuff. And I'm like, if I were to explain this to a jury, they wouldn't understand it the way I do. It takes years to understand the weight and, and values of different types of evidence for things. Different levels of, I don't know, psychological trauma, the ramifications of self-inflicted pain or death, the vastness of the world. And then these politicians go to these meetings and they talk about big topics with small brains and make decisions on behalf of the rest of the world. Oh, we're going to remove Coca-Cola from the vending machines and things like that just to look good, just for, just for brownie points. And the rest of us are, are left to just live in the world that they decide we'll live in simply because they want to play these games. It's, it's things like this that just, that remind me like how stupid the legislative and judicial system actually is. There's so many rules. You can't talk to the jury. You can't ask leading questions. Uh, sometimes, sometimes this stuff is needed. Like sometimes you need to be able to ask leading questions. You need to be able to say some hearsay. You need to be able to talk to the jury and, and say something outside the scope to truly explain to them the full picture of things. And sometimes just an in-court explanation isn't enough. Sometimes you need a lot more time to think and ponder. Just thinking about all this stuff makes me like think about all these like serious guys in suits and making these decisions and they all look so small. Like you just want to like smack them in the face and tell them to shut up and look at the night sky and let go of all this bullshit. Like holy shit the way these institutions abuse science in courtrooms, expecting people to educate themselves in a day. I didn't, I didn't warp my perspective. I didn't learn all this stuff overnight. It took me like, like my whole life up until that point. This is why I dropped politics. Cause I would watch these videos of like, of like people like Jordan Peterson debating politicians in like a meeting and the politicians would talk to him like, so this is how things work and we're making these strict harsh decisions that the entire world must abide by um simply because we feel like uh this is how things are uh or this is how things not we feel like it this is how things are objectively that's how it is and it's like all of these things are still up in the air it makes all these people seem so small-brained like such small thoughts but back to the theory so Do we live in four dimensions? You know what? Fuck it. Let's go for it. Yeah. I mean, honestly, you get to decide. Because we don't interact with four dimensions, spatially, right? Or in any other way, but... In a way, you could say we do. Depending on your definition of dimension. It's it's in the eye of the beholder, honestly. And... This goes without saying, I hope... 
but the universe appears to have a lot of odd things going on with it that four dimension really four dimensions really really helps us to explain like first of all dark energy right i think i think dark energy is misleading like the words dark energy like let's let's instead of dark energy let's call it the acceleration of the expansion of space within space actually dark energy is a pretty good name never mind um also from what we've seen the universe isn't curved there isn't like a a sphere or a hyperboloid or a fucking donut uh, that that makes up the universe because that was a possibility and me and my friends would like laugh our asses off when we'd look at this stuff when we'd look at what people say about the universe they'd be like oh it could be shaped like a donut and like when we were little kids like that that's like the funniest thing ever when people say that and it's funny how like that's like the official name of the shape now it's not the official name but it's like it's funny how every like nobody calls it a torus anymore and that, it's like that is what it is. it is officially a donut no, a donut is the name of that shape. Taurus, no. Use that word for something else. It's it's free. It's it's open now. Taurus no longer means that shape. The shape will is and forever will be officially known as a donut. However, I always imagine that if we actually did live in a four-dimensional sphere, we would never be able to tell. Like never. There'd be nothing we could do to tell because every experiment we'd ever be able to do would be locked in three dimensions. Like, if, if, like, fruit flies on a soap bubble that are constantly expanding, the space of their two-dimensional world would appear to be expanding. But in reality, it's just the 3D bubble that's growing. However, this is a bit different. And there's another problem that arises. See, the fruit flies could start walking in a straight line, right? And eventually, they'll reach right back to where they started. Because that's how spheres work. If you travel in a straight line anywhere, you know, if you go, if you go north in a straight line, eventually, if you start walking far enough, eventually you'll start moving south. In fact... All straight lines on a sphere are circles. They always connect back to each other. They always appear to be curved from an outsider's perspective. In the same way that space-time curves around large bodies of mass, like your mom. And I'm sorry, I'm, I'm not going to make that joke anymore. It's getting old. But in the same way that light travels in a straight line through curved space. And in that way, we could... If the universe is a four-dimensional sphere, we could travel in a straight line. We could keep, you know, we could send a rocket through space, go all the way, just travel through in a straight line, not move, you know, not accelerate. Um, and we would eventually reach the same point as we started. It would probably take more time than uh, the universe has left in its existence. It would probably never happen because of the expansion of the universe. Um, and it would probably because... At a certain point, the expansion, the expansion of this soap bubble would go faster than you could ever travel. The, the, the distance between um, where you are versus where you started on the other side would keep growing larger and larger no matter how fast you kept on going. And that's already happening, actually. Um, so it's, it's not like we'll ever be able to figure that out, like, definitively. But in theory, we could travel in a straight line and reach the same point that we started at. If it is a sphere, that is. If it's a sphere. Not, I mean, other shapes are a bit different. But if it's a sphere, that is true. Also, any, any straight line on a sphere will eventually converge and inter intersect with other straight lines. Like, parallel lines cannot exist on a sphere. Remember how the only way not to converge is... To actually curve the paths of 2D lines, of straight lines, when you when you perceive space-time and gravity 
and you kind of look at it all as like a sphere that you can go around and go back in the same point in, that would actually lead to a bit of a problem because loops in space would imply loops in time. And I mean like loops in time, like exactly what you're picturing. I literally mean exactly that, what you're thinking about in your head. Like time literally looping, repeating itself over and over and over again, trapping people inside to be slaves to the never-ending battle between Dormammu and Doctor Strange. Like the sci-fi time loop, that's exactly what this is. If space is also a loop. Which you could say, okay, Big Bang, end of the universe, boom, loops, right? Um, and 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 there's there's merit to that idea. And also, Einstein predicted that he 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 said that if the universe was like spinning, like the whole universe, we would end up in the same place and time as we once were eventually, a time loop. But I think there's more to it because to say the word eventually implies that there could be an outside observer that would be experiencing a different kind of time, not a different, not like a different relative time, but a different kind of time as if there were two time dimensions, that, that there's outside observers that could experience us in a loop. Otherwise, it's not a loop. Otherwise, it's just reality. To say that a time loop could exist would imply that there is another time dimension that an observer living in that time dimension could view us in that loop and see us repeating ourselves over and over and over again. This, I don't think this would happen partially because of um, what I know about entanglement or what I think about entanglement, not know. Um, but mainly because we're pretty damn positive there isn't a second time dimension. Not that we know of, at least. Um, maybe it's changed since the last time I checked. But as far as I know, nobody really thinks there's a second time dimension. And if the universe really was a sphere, the real, the real test um, would, would actually be pretty simple. Maybe difficult, but simple. It would imply that there is some sort of convergence um, of time upon movement. Because if there's convergence of space, there's convergence of time. Because we're all moving through the time dimension, right? I mean, maybe we're not. Maybe, maybe we're not moving. Th but I think most people would agree we're moving through the time dimension. And if we're moving through the time dimension, then... Oh, wait, maybe we're not moving through the time dimension in a parallel way. Maybe uh, because we are objects that exert gravity, maybe that is enough acceleration for us to... Oh, that's it. Yeah, never mind. Never mind. I'm not going to go there. That's that's easily disproven with, with a bit of logic. Never mind. Forget I said that. Damn, I'm still, still got it, kind of. I'm a little rusty, but I still got it. I can still... Um, think about these things and, and form new conclusions. But yeah, this is this is why I don't like to call time a dimension because it's just too odd compared to like the dimensions that we think about. Well, actually, I do call time dimension now. Um, I didn't back then. I don't mind now. I'm not so picky about words. But yeah, back then I didn't. I was like, we got to have a new word for this. But Back then, I was actually able to, like, really mental gymnastics my way around separating time and space as unique properties that are intertwined. Um, and maybe today I can finagle some jank explanation about how the universe can be curved in space but flat in time. Um, not, like, flat in a physical way, but more, like, flat in, like, the surface of the ocean way. But the surface of the ocean is curved... But you know what I mean, in, in a surface of the ocean from a carnal perspective way. But time is more like the ocean in the way that there's waves and there's crashes and there's bubbles and breaks and all that stuff. 
but yeah, from what I can tell, space actually does appear to be flat. And I think this is pretty new. I think this is th this was definitely after the people definitely came to this definitive, much more definitive conclusion after I stopped studying this. Like people are generally in agreement that space is not curved. It is flat. Um, I think I think people are pretty certain about this now. Carl Sagan even says uh, in this video and project. He says later on, a fourth physical dimension, not that way, not that way, not that way, but at right angles to those three directions. I can't show you what direction that is, but imagine that there is a fourth physical dimension. In that case, we would generate a four dimensional hypercube, which is also called a tesseract. I cannot show you a tesseract because I and you are trapped in three dimensions. But what I can show That's what it would look like a shadow. A shadow in three dimensions of a four-dimensional hypercube or tesseract this is it and you can see it's very obvious like this line is a lot bigger than this line and it's also a lot bigger than this line but the shadow of the cube that we saw also had these inconsistencies see it's two nested cubes all the vertices connected by lines. and this is just one like this is just a shadow of a very like you know how when you twist a cube um, above the air and it shows up as uh, different in different ways with different lengths and different angles? This is just the one that we know and like. Like if you do like cube, like this, uh, not like this, but like, you know, the drawings where it's like uh, flat down the middle, where it's like um, symmetrical where this point is right here and it goes like this and that and like this point is directly above it so it's like a, a diamond like this and then it goes down and it's another diamond like that connected like this like this like this so from this particular angle like you see how there's all these other angles like there's this angle there's this angle you know there's this angle there's this angle uh, there's this angle but from this particular angle this like very nice, uh, symmetrical, easy to understand angle, right? This angle is the equivalent of this one. Something like um, something something like this right here would would look more like would more look more like a cube, and then another cube, and then they're kind of connected. It would look like two cubes connected um, that are like see-through. But yeah, that's, it doesn't, this is, this is misleading. It just looks beautiful. It, it's absolutely beautiful. So people use this as like the representation of a hypercube, but of a four-dimensional hypercube. But uh, like, keep in mind, this is just from one specific angle of uh, of the shadow i mean if you twist the cube in any way in the fourth dimension it'll look very different from this and now and the lines will start tesseract i think there's animations of it i i'll, I'll look for it later but. four dimensions would have all the lines of equal length and all the angles right angles that's not what we see here but that's the penalty of projection so you see while we cannot imagine the world of four dimensions we can certainly think about it perfectly well. What? He didn't talk about it? Wait. Structure of the cosmos. Astronomers sometimes say that okay. space is curved. Or that the universe is uh, finite but unbounded. Whatever are they talking about? So yeah, that that's that's what I'm talking about right now. So um I have a bullet point for this. Good thing I wrote this one down. Okay. So, damn, no, the bullet point was from earlier. But, okay, yeah. So, when Carl Sagan was like, it's space, scientists always talk about space being, uh, uh, you know, curved or finite but unbounded. That's, that's literally what he's saying. But, I think recently we've gotten pretty damn sure that 
the space is flat. Because there's a very simple experiment you can do. Just send two objects traveling in a parallel line to each other. Um, and if they ever touch, like, that's why gravity gets in the way. That's why gravity's a bit iffy. If they ever eventually touch without any outside interference, then we live in a uh, limited, we live in a world where if eventually if you go uh, far enough in a straight line, you will end up back in the spot that you started at, time and space. Um, but if they don't touch, if they continue to travel in a, parallel, in a parallel line, then you can be pretty damn sure that, um, like almost certain, that space doesn't loop back on itself and that space is flat. And there is some iffiness to this. Like, I think that there is a possibility that there are things that, that could account for that and that the universe could uh, make, has things that could adjust this sort of thing to keep objects moving in parallel. Um, and there's all, also this idea that maybe the universe is just so big that even if it's curved, we still can't, we, we would have, we don't have no way to tell because we can't actually make that observation on our own on any scale that we could ever do. Um, so that's definitely a possibility, but I think pretty, or pre people are pretty damn sure that the universe is flat because in curved space, objects traveling in a straight line would converge every single time. But in, in, in that way, you can also negatively converge space. Like you can, you can have negative, like the problem with what I'm saying here is that it's very hard to perceive four dimensions. Um, so it's not like the easiest thing to explain unless you already know what I'm talking about. But if we imagine like a shadow of our three dimensional world on a two dimensional plane being curved, right? No matter what direction it's being curved in, it will cause convergence. Like if you fold a piece of paper and you send a straight line, that like if you fold a piece of paper into a ball, you send a straight line down it, it doesn't matter which way you fold the ball, it will always curve back in on itself. And it, it'll cause convergence no matter what. All curving will cause convergence, some, somewhat, partial, partially at least. However, I believe that on a mathematical level, there is, if, if you can have a universe that can allow for negative numbers, then there is a potential for negatively curving the universe. And although it's difficult to imagine, uh, maybe impossible to imagine, I can't imagine it, but in that kind of universe, that would cause parallel lines to diverge, which kind of makes you wonder, like, if we perceive our time dimension as roughly parallel lines, maybe a, a way you can perceive branching the lines and splitting off into many different universes as we're moving along this, this so-called straight lines to the future, maybe that isn't this like multivert, maybe it isn't the convergence of positive curves that explain gravity. Maybe this is divergence. And maybe that divergence explains dark energy. Maybe dark energy is just, there is no energy involved. Actually, there probably is no energy involved. But maybe it's just our observation of a negatively curved universe. And I proposed this idea. I've been proposing it uh, for a while before that, by the way. Um, and I'll propose it again, even though I don't really buy it all that much. But I'll propose it again. Maybe dark energy is the universe becoming... Ah, uh, there isn't a way to word it. Uh, four-dimensionally concave? No. Um, that would need five dimensions. Okay. Um, what an ugly way to describe it. I can't, there's no words for it. There's no words. See, when it comes to the shape of the universe, 
it's we're not certain it's flat okay we're pretty sure it's flat but we're not certain at least as far as i know i haven't looked at the new stuff but we're pretty sure but because it doesn't need to be flat it turns out there's actually this like goldilocks amount of matter per every unit of space that makes a universe flat that makes a space flat rather and any less matter and the universe would curve any more matter and the universe would also curve in the other direction however since the dawn of time there's always been more matter in these units of space than we have now the space is expanding and because the universe is expansion we live in a flat universe just right now who's to say that it's only like this simply because of when we're observing it simply because of this exact moment it's kind of like it's kind of like it could be coincidental how right now is the exact time that we've reached a point, um, like a point of no return in terms of dark energy expanding faster than gravity can hold us together, while at the same time we've reached a point where, where human beings have the ability to observe that. Like uh, everything outside the uh, Virgo supercluster, definitely for sure, for 100% sure, and most likely everything outside the local group probably is always going to be out of reach and will forever remain out of reach to humans in the future no matter what and okay alcubierre drive fine i'll 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 grant you that um actually no i won't space is expanding the amount of energy it took for the slightest gravitational waves to pass through earth was so so massive the amount of energy it would take to warp space time in a, in a meaningful way to actually let you traverse long distances and things like that i don't think the the universe even has that much energy in it total so yeah harvesting that much energy would be a, a quick way to end the world So I I will go as far as to say everything outside the local group will forever remain out of reach to humans. Maybe it's just that now there are less particles per unit of space and it causes the the slight curvature or like contraction of four-dimensional space that is causing the expansion of three-dimensional space. Like like a like a like a four-dimensional ball moving through a three-dimensional cross-section. The shape of the universe is staying flat, right? It's staying the same. It's staying a three-dimensional cross-section, but it's growing larger and larger and larger. And with this, like like an inflating balloon in four dimensions, and with this expansion comes even less particles per cubic unit of space and thus even more curvature and even faster expansion and boom acceleration and even better an energy source of this acceleration appearing to be from nothing a dark energy source maybe we just caught it at the right time while the universe appears to be flat still but maybe you won't be flat for very long and by very long, I mean like billions, trillions of years into the future. Oh, probably more. 10 to the power of whatever. Okay, I don't want to run this on for too long. Let's just, let's get to the good part, okay? Like I said earlier, we have string theory, field theory, which both kind of consist of the multiverse theory because they kind of rely on being probabilistic rather than pure cause and effect deterministic maybe string theory not so much but these are just two interpretations now we get to the real shit okay i know everyone's heard of this one before 
drum roll please, simulation theory, which wasn't so hot back then. Um, like, I don't know if you guys remember, nobody was talking about it, but after Donald Trump got elected and uh, Bitcoin hit $10,000 and Elon Musk became the main character of Earth, that's when it became all the rage among the young whippersnappers. So people talk about simulations, but they don't put much effort into making them make sense or saying anything profound, really. But I came up with something pretty cool. And this was, dude, I cannot stress, I'm, not, I'm really about to brag, right? I'm really about to flex this, bro. I cannot stress enough how little people cared about simulation theory in 2013. Like nobody gave a crap. Find anything about anybody talking about simulations in 2013. Nobody cared. But I was one of the people that cared. I need, I need you guys to understand something, okay? There's millions of kids out there, like math and science kids, who just like me, they heard about things like black holes and they fell into the rabbit hole of astrophysics and the adjacent areas of study. And also keep in mind, I never actually was like really with the shit when it came to this stuff. I was just brainstorming. Like there's entire college courses on black holes. Like you can, you can literally graduate college with a major in black hole research. It's such a complex and vast pit of information that you could spend a lifetime studying it. So people know a lot more about black holes than I do. Like way, way, way more. So I know, going into this, I'm going to say things that are stupid. And now that I'm older, I know them to be stupid. I know they're incorrect. But just keep in mind, I was 13 and I really thought, like I was, I thought black holes were just so, so cool. Like that's all you really care about when you're 13. In a 13-year-old boy's brain, the only things he cares about are things that are cool. That's it. So, yeah, I was like, this wasn't the healthiest um, part of my life. Just sitting at home all day watching cool space videos. I never even went out and actually saw the uh, galaxy with like a with like a clear sky even once. Like no... A, sky with no light pollution even once i would just look online it was not the healthiest but remember earlier how i said whatever my theory is it has to take into account the connection between um gravity matter energy speed of light uh all that stuff right it has to take into account all of um, our restrictions to the three dimensions, like why, why are we restricted to three dimensions? If the universe is 11 dimensions, why are we restricted to three? It has to take that into account. It has to take into account a possible fourth dimension. Um, and also it has to take into account black holes. Not that I was really out here doing the world of service by like going like, okay, my theory has to take into account black holes. It was more like, I was like, oh boy, I can't wait to talk about black holes. Uh, I can't believe my theory has to also include all this other garbage. I just want a theory about black holes. So that was the coolest part of it. So some of it, some of some of what I'm what, what I thought of works with the standard model. Some of it works with string theory. Um, but what about with this new theory that people are starting to talk about? Like simulation, like let's try, let's try to work out my aether, my my understanding of, of, of the world that I have in my new weird warp, warped perspective, um, let's try it to work it all out in simulation theory and see what we get. You know, let's throw stuff at the wall and see what sticks. Just to see if we can find something interesting here. Just to see if we can make some connections, right? And you're going to want to pay attention right here because this is, this is the good stuff, all right? Now, there's something you need to understand about black holes. Newtonian physics kind of doesn't really apply to black holes like at all, unless you're really, really far away. In fact, Newton's law of gravity, despite being the, the, the formula that we learn in school, is actually just straight up incorrect. Einstein's is correct and consistent across the board. It's tested to a million times 
never failed once, um, except for the one time that it failed and we looked into it and turns out the instruments were not calibrated properly. Um, so yeah, but it, Einstein's equations are a tad bit too difficult to teach like sleep deprived little kids who don't even know what thermodynamics is because it's not in the curriculum. So I, I didn't bother to actually learn like in depth um, Einstein's papers. And Isaac Newton was a lot more interesting to learn about at the time. Like this dude was weird as fuck, bro. This man figured out gravitational attraction, but he couldn't attract any bitches. Like, yeah, Newton's laws are not actually accurate, like, at all. Um, it's only, like, really, really, really close to being accurate. Only when you're talking about giant celestial bodies with tons of mass, uh, like comets and stars and planets and your mom and moons and comets, mainly comets. Um, that was the real tricky one that he got down uh, with, with calculus that he invented. Um, so if you can figure out the math to predict the orbits of these, like, blatantly elliptical orbits of comets, then you can, you can figure out, you know, the barely elliptical orbits, the much simpler elliptical orbits of everything else. And so when he saw this comet that showed up, uh, when he was a kid, basically, he, uh, came up with the math and explained how it moved. He didn't bother to, like, he didn't think it was all that, uh, impressive. But him and some dude named, um, Edmund Haley were watching the comet and they're like, huh, I wonder if that's how it works. Edmund Haley, Edmund Haley. That name sounds so familiar. Anyways, see, scientists, and this is going to sound crazy, but scientists aren't even sure if the force of gravity on objects really, really small and really, really far away is either really negligible to the point where we can't measure it or if it just doesn't actually apply. Like maybe, like scientists have theorized that maybe there is actually a certain amount of distortion in space-time required to activate this like attractive gravitational um, attraction. <laughs> You learn in school that a light particle 10 billion light years away from us is actually attracting us to it a very tiny amount, and we're attracting it to us a very tiny amount. We still don't know if that's true or not, actually. We know that, like, a black hole, uh, we know that, like, supercluster uh, cosmic filaments, you know, 5, 10 uh, billion light years away, are actually, like, we know great attractor, shapely, supercluster, all that stuff. We know that this stuff is actually gravitationally uh, um, pulling us a very, a very tiny amount, but um, we don't have any clue if a random particle in the atmosphere is on, on some exoplanet 12 billion light years away, if that's attracting us. You know, we have, we have no clue. Even like a star that's that far away. We don't have any idea if that actually is gravitationally um, linked to us at all. If it is, then great, right? You can rest assured knowing that every single girl in the universe is attracted to you. And uh, that includes all the girls watching this. All four of you. And that also makes... Uh, that also makes you gay for existing because that means that every guy in the universe is also attracted to all the other guys in the universe. That's a, that's a intelligent shit post right there. Like, Hey, is existing gay? I mean, the fluctuations of quantum fields that appear to make up who we are, are all attracted to each other. So if you take two men who claim to be straight and you put them in deep space where they're unaffected by the gravity of other celestial bodies, they'll die, but they'll also get closer and closer together until they eventually touch. I don't know, man. I'm not trying to knock existing, but 
seems kind of sus if you ask me. Oh, what what am I saying, dude? I need to I need to sleep. But back to gravity. Honestly, it's it's an idea. It's an idea that in these like super voids of space, right? It could work in the same way that the calm belt works in One Piece, where there simply is no um, apparent like pulling of gravity to speak, right? But let's just assume, like I said, I'm going to say a lot of incorrect things. I was a kid. Don't crucify me for it, okay? Please. Let's just say that, that this is true. Everywhere, for all particles. Let's say... Look, Newton is wrong, okay? So it's... It, this, this is up in the air right now, but let's assume he was right, okay? And that means Einstein is wrong, but let's assume for a second that Newton was right. There's a lot of room for error in what I'm about to say, especially with particles touching. Because particles, uh, from our observations, are more like droplets of probability in the form of like condensed cotton balls of, of fields in, in the clear foam of the universe, right? But let's just keep the, the hypothetical principle at play here that, that particles follow all of Newton's laws, that quantum mechanics is not a thing, three dimensions, the way you imagine particles to be like a basketball like very very tiny movement through space like they're all like that right bounce off of each other all that stuff so the force of gravity exerted between two objects is determined by a fraction okay on top is the mass of the objects and on the bottom is the distance between them the greater the mass is the more gravitational force exists between them, the greater the numerator, and thus the greater the, the number. And then the greater the distance between the objects, the bigger the denominator, the smaller the number overall. But there, it is always there, no matter what distance, it, it always exists. So, makes sense, right? More distance, weaker gravitational force, more mass, stronger gravitational force. Um, and vice versa for both. So let's bring them closer. Okay, let's let's take objects and make them closer together. The smaller denominator, the more the, the closer two objects are together, the stronger the gravitational force between them. This part here, right, this inverse square, this is actually right on this scale. Um or or more accurately it's it's precise, but not right. Okay, so get this. What do you think would happen when two particles are so close together that they're touching? Which never actually happens. But let's say, what happens if they do, hypothetically? What does the equation look like, at least? You know, It's hard to imagine, but what would the equation look like? Well, that means there's a zero for the distance in the denominator. A zero in the denominator. Guys, pull out a calculator and try to divide a number by zero. It'll throw an error. Why? Because it simply doesn't work. Say you have 10 cookies and you try to divide them among zero friends. How many cookies does each friend get? See, it doesn't make sense. Infinite? Well, no, because if you change the amount to five cookies, then is, that, is the answer to that question half of infinite in that case? As if there's a difference in those infinities? Well, there aren't even any friends to eat the infinite cookies you've supposedly given them. So, zero? But that would mean... But that would mean, if it's zero, that, mean, that would mean that you have zero cookies. That would mean that you could rearrange the equation in a paradoxical way where zero times zero equals five or 10, or whatever you really want. So our laws of physics, like our mathematics that we have, 
that we all abide by, the axioms that we abide by, that we agree, okay, timesing something um, works like this, adding something works like this, dividing works like this. The axioms that we hold to be true simply don't allow for our universe to divide by zero. Maybe in a different universe with different physics, right? Maybe one with a bit more um, human uh, subjective harmony, right? Where like pi is three, golden ratio is two, where space is shaped like a donut because of course, who doesn't want, who doesn't want a universe shaped like a donut? Maybe in a universe like that, dividing by zero is just another part of the math. But in our universe, you just can't do it. You'll get an error. Like you can't, it's not like the result is an error. You can't do it. Pay attention. So back to our simulation. Imagine we live in a simulation. What happens if you have a lot of movement happening, okay? Something's moving very fast in a world and you have to render all of that, right? Let's say you put a hard limit on someone's movement. Like, you know, how in Breath of the Wild, if you're moving too fast through the air and it's unable to render the stuff around you, it'll actually freeze your character in place until it can render that and then it'll continue your momentum. So what happens then? And we, let's, let's call that light. Let's call that ray tracing. You see, what I, you see where I'm going with this? The computer needs to render these intense uh, fluctuations in the foam jello of space-time, right? It needs to render all of the interactions that you have with gravity and light, um, as well as like all this, uh, this insane change in entanglement um, and, and the interactions of a ton, tons and tons of particles at super high speed. And ray tracing isn't a problem for like the new age NVIDIA cards unless something is moving, right? Then, then these NVIDIA cards still struggle with it quite a bit. Uh, have you seen like Minecraft 4K ray tracing videos? Yeah, the, it's, it's not easy, it's not easy. It could, these people are out here like pushing their computers to their limits, creating like fire hazards basically. Every computer has its limits. If you simulate too much, if you try to simulate too much, they're, they're Let's say you take a ton of ton of stuff in a video game, okay, in a simulation. Ton of matter. Let's call it matter. I'm, I'm trying to make the connection here, okay? You put it all in one tiny little area. Or you try to encode a video with way, way too much detail, stupid high bit rate. Or you try to render an image in Cinema 4D with like a million different reflective surfaces and, and like a million different light sources while we're at it. And then all these particle effects and stuff on top of all that. And all the light sources have to illuminate the particles as well. Well, the computer is going to slow down. Kind of like how the faster you move, or the more stuff is compressed into a smaller space, like the more dense something is, the more gravity an object experiences, the slower time passes for it in the real world. Essentially, Doing a lot of stuff, pushing the universe to its limits, causes the frame rate to be slower the more stuff is going on. Just like how in, like in GoldenEye, where if you look down, um, like GoldenEye 64, if you look down while you're moving and you don't render the wall textures on the buildings and stuff, the game actually runs faster, thus killing the enjoyment of watching GoldenEye speedruns, but I digress. I don't know if they killed the enjoyment of playing the speedruns. I think it did do that as well, but people still speedrun it, but I can't watch the speedruns anymore. They're absolute garbage. So here's the fun part, right? Just like with Earth, when you get closer and closer to, to the center of Earth or to, to a massive body, time slows down more and more. When you get closer and closer to a black hole, same thing. It's a very massive object. It's a, infinitely dense is such a terrible way to word it but let's call it that sure it's an infinitely dense object i i'd rather just say it's a singularity but i know for a lot of people watching um they won't quite understand what a singularity really is but for this infinitely dense object the closer and closer you get to it time slows down more and more and more and in a black hole where the light 
the speed of light, all that stuff, doesn't apply. Light cannot exist. Light is the ultimate arbitrator. It's the mediator of time in the universe. So when light stops existing in that area, time stops. Time slows down, it slows down more and more and more, and it stops. And physics in general just stops working. Like any physics we try to do in, in a black hole, the calculators just give us errors. Guys, what I said earlier, what happens when you take the distance of two particles and make them so close that they touch? You divide by zero and you get an error. The calculators give you errors. What is a black hole? It's particles so close that they're touching. <sighs> Antimatter explosion. I was such a nerd. Our computer that we're being simulated on, hypothetically, isn't perfect. It has its limits. And the more stuff going on, the slower it renders. And you might say, okay, the players, would they not be able to see these slow renders? Well, these renders manifest themselves in redshift. In order to um, prevent, like if you're running The Sims, if you're running The Sims, you don't want them to think that their universe is slowing down. You don't want them to think that they're simulated. So while you slow down the processes of um, objects, the more stuff that's happening, the more ray tracing that's going on, you also slow down the capabilities of the observer. So we're not able to observe the slowdown of the universe. We're just a part of that as well. We're a part of the universe. And if this computer, this limited computer that we're being rendered on right now, if too much stuff is going on, so much stuff, that there, the, that it makes the um, computer throw an error, if, if there's a part of it that backfires, and, and let's say that there's a, a, a threshold that needs to be reached for objects to be gravitationally attracted to each other, okay? And when all these objects are gravitationally attracted to each other, it forms a program. So everything has a, a, a gravitational amount, but just like how with 32-bit or 64-bit computers, there is a minimum requirement for it to be active. So let's say after a certain point, it is active. And that creates a program, right? If that program, cra if you're on a computer and one program crashes, all the other programs don't crash. So if the computer has some error in the coding that allows for it to simulate equations that throw errors, the simulation crashes, the physics engine crashes, in that contained area and it becomes inaccessible to the NPCs so that way the NPCs don't crash the rest of the game. That's black holes. Black holes are rendering errors in, in they're, they're the whole, this program is not responding. They're those types of crashes in the simulation program that is our computer. Just like how if you try to load up Crisis 3 on an Apple II, you'll get errors. Just like how if you try to load up Crisis 3 on a supercomputer, you'll get errors. Or if you try to load up Premiere Pro on a perfectly good, decent computer on a regular basis, you'll get errors. Because Adobe does not give a fuck about errors. Even if you do nothing wrong, you'll still get errors. Thanks, Adobe. And just like how when Premiere crashes, it's not the whole computer that crashes. Google Chrome is fine. So... The black hole is Premiere Pro not responding and force quitting, corrupting the file, aka deleting matter. So even though all of the ones and zeros cannot be flipped without something doing that flipping, there is a part of the computer where the, the, the BIOS, the whatever, the, the control, the CPU, whatever, will, will go, all right, delete this file, throw it away. Delete the matter here. The matter here no longer exists because it's a corrupted file. And maybe Hawking radiation 
was a built-in mechanic by the creators of our simulation to restore the matter in our universe in the form of a supremely stable virtual particle that is just a very, very simple, um, like, you know how old software, when people make them really simple old software with like assembly and stuff, and it's it's airtight and it very, um, very well understood, it doesn't crash, it's, it's just the stable, the most stable programs you can have. In, in that same way, that could be the backup program. That could be the, um, the like, doomsday program. That okay, we're gonna we're gonna take this area of this of this hard drive, wipe it, reset it back to zeros, on whatever co uh, computer hardware we're running, and maybe those zeros, collectively end up being rendered as virtual particles, extremely stable. Um, so that way these crashes don't get so out of hand, and uh, the computer can recover the corrupted storage space, and maybe quantum tunneling, maybe the spontaneous uh, creation of, of um, iron or the spontaneous creation of black holes and things like that. Maybe that's like the equivalent of um, what people on Earth would observe as like a bit flip from, from a, a, a sun's cosmic ray, where uh, they did that like Super Mario 64 speedrunning thing, the bit flip. Maybe it's just these like little quantum errors on the computer that we're running on. Maybe the computer we're running on is not infallible. And that these little errors and inconsistencies we find are just the errors from our computer. It's it's actually a really, really interesting thought. I'm I'm the whole idea of um being able to take a partition of the storage and clear the binary from it so that you have empty space to add new stuff. Like, that is something I thought about a bit more recently, like in like 2016, 2017. But that could totally be like a, 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 a backup mechanism to prevent the, the black holes, aka the errors in the simulation from getting way too out of hand. So built in Hawking radiation. Boom, that's my contribution. I came up with that. I connected the puzzle pieces together to come up with this crazy simulation worldview interpretation. That shit got like 12k upvotes on Reddit when I posted it back then, which was crazy for back then, by the way. Um, it was 2013. It actually goes a bit further than this. I, I did I did do quite a bit of work creating like a system to actually map out and, and try to explain the constants uh, gravity, dark energy, that sort of thing. But math is boring to me now. <laughs> and uh, the only way you're really ever going to get interest from the masses uh, as a scientist is if you talk about black holes and stuff. So the way I framed my contribution on Reddit was entirely around the idea that black holes are these like system throttling measures to prevent like these, the higher beings, um, you know, quadrillion core CPUs from melting, trying to simulate um, the equivalent of like our computers trying to simulate uh, the weather in a Bose-Einstein condensate, you know? Like, gee, I fucking wonder what's going to happen. I wonder if we can simulate that, you know? I don't actually see the universe much this way anymore. Um, but way back when... The, the simple fact that all the laws of physics all follow predictable mathematical formulas in the same way that our computers um, run on mathematical written formulas, that was enough proof for me to, to make that leap. If, if this was a real world, why would physics even conform to our mathematical aesthetics and comprehension? Like, why are the fundamental formulas even repetitive or rational? Like, why not totally random? Why don't laws of physics change as time passes? Like, why are they predictable? And why does physics break if the system gets too hot? Like, you ever think about that? Just like how if a computer is running too much, then typically people will have um, contingencies in place. Uh, like, if a computer is overheating, it'll stop programs from running, it'll throttle the system, like when Apple throttled their CPUs to prevent... Um, battery loss and stuff. 
why does there seem to be this like apparent um, shutting off of core system, core system functionality when, um, when there could be bottlenecking in the compute power of the universe? Or like how it seems like the developers made certain laws of physics that make no apparent sense, but seem like really great countermeasures to prevent from paradoxes and system errors. Like angular momentum conservation. That makes no fucking sense, dude. But it seems more like just a sneaky way for us to like hack our way into um, making objects travel faster than light. So angular momentum is like a is like a contingency to prevent that. Angular momentum is a fucking enigma to me, dude. It's like bra momentum. But it's kind of um it's kind of odd when you when you really think about it. When you imagine the 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 universe as a simulation and that the laws of physics that were given are if you think about it in the way like, okay, we run simulations, right? We as humans, we run simulations on computers. And we'll set a computer and we'll tell it, okay, run a million different simulations and see and change the physics of the simulation ever so slightly every time um, and, and follow these uh, algorithms when you're changing the um, physics of it so that way you can end up re uh, resulting in the best possible end result. Let's say, for example, our higher beings are trying to simulate on a computer. For example, just an example. Let's say they're trying to simulate. How can we create a universe uh, that, that maybe a three-dimensional universe, just to limit it, just so, so that they don't overload their computers. How can we simulate a three-dimensional universe that um, can last in perpetuity, right? How can they simulate it? to last as long as possible. And maybe they put in these contingencies just to just to make a challenge for themselves. Okay, no perpetual motion machines, none of that. I said, okay, we're gonna do all this stuff and we're gonna have all these laws put in place. What let's let this computer run. Let's do let's have it run um, you know, trillions of simulations and each time it'll be slightly different physics and let's let it run um, just to see which ones will last the longest. And maybe we're one of these simulations down the line and we're one of the failed experiments because it's looking like there's, it's, it's almost all agreed upon by now. Maybe not by now, but at least back then, I don't know how much has changed, but at least back then, pretty much almost every scientist agreed, yeah, the universe is headed towards heat death and there's nothing we could do about it. So, yeah, maybe, um, maybe we're just one of these simulations that are just part of this game that these guys are playing where they're trying to figure out how they could simulate a three-dimensional universe that would last as long as possible, you know? And maybe we're just one of the ones that just happened to last as long as we did. So that really screws with, with, with your mental. That really screws with the whole idea of free will, with, screws with your whole idea of having meaning in life and all that, but it's just a thought, you know? But it really makes you think, like, why are, like, why do these beautiful mathematical constants even exist in the first place, golden ratio and whatnot? And why are they constants? Like, you ever think about that? Why are constants actually constant? How come uh, we observe particles and they don't even exist in the way that we think they do? It's almost like it's almost like everything is written as strings of code. Strings, pun, pun intended, intended. Strings, you know, because string. Thing. It's almost like everything's written in strings of code, and the universe just interprets the written code as different kinds of particles. Like the universe has a set of backend instructions as to how the code should run and how to render each variable. And it just gives us this sort of like uh, math random Java wave function upon observation. Or maybe, or upon interaction, like gravitational interaction. 
when it when it renders what appears to be a particle just like how in video games they don't render infinitely generated worlds they just use math to determine what the world would be based on the infinitely generating um, generation algorithm and they only render whatever is within your render distance it could all be like these constants and stuff they could all be back-end code um and there could be a lot more back-end code that we can never observe like for example light is massless yet it still interacts with gravity maybe because gravity is linked with time um also because it's able to travel at the speed of lights um while nothing with mass can travel at the speed of lights for some reason this like force this if you if you imagine that gravity is actually a particle like a graviton that means that the the particle has to also be massless according to our standard model because gravity travels at the speed of light however anything that's massless will not only be able to travel at the speed of light it will be forced to travel at the speed of light but think about it if energy pure energy by itself is traveling at the speed of light matter is just compressed energy there's no real reason why mass shouldn't be able to travel at the speed of light there's no real reason why photons of light should be massless they just don't interact with the higgs boson for some reason actually not even boson we discovered the particle and it said ha wrong direction bozo get it like wrong direction boson but yeah not the Higgs boson, it was the Higgs field. They just don't interact with the Higgs field the way everything else does. It's almost like someone wrote a line of code like, if particle interacts with Higgs field equals true, then not equals true. If particle interact with Higgs field, um, then mass also equals true and limit movement speed to C. It's like straight up video game physics engine logic. Interesting because the most popular game engine in the world is called Unity. Actually, maybe it's Unreal Engine. That might be more popular now. But when, back when I first started like coding and stuff, Unity was by far the biggest game engine. You know, Unity, like the unity of the universe. Mathematical formulas are actually really weird if you think about them. And this is all just for a thought experiment. Like, this is all just to get your brain, um, you know, moving in, in any direction. This is not, like, anything definitive that I've ever, like, really been able to, to put out there. If I, if I write a program and I use it to simulate the universe and I set gravity to be a constant, well, then it'll always be that, right? Repeatable, testable, in experiments. Or I could set it to random. But random isn't actually truly random uh, with the computer. You just have to figure out whatever the algorithm on the computer is using, decrypt it, however long it takes. It is possible. It's always possible. And with enough pattern recognition, like enough trial and error, you can crack the algorithm. That's why Cloud Cloudflare uses lava lamps as their RNG. But to create a simulation that is truly random, with observable phenomena that can't be described by a formula, that would be pretty solid proof that we don't live in a simulation. And yet we don't have that. We don't have that randomness. From what we can see, the universe is mathematics down to its core. We don't even know what kind of universe would need to exist in order to qualify to have a truly non-cause and effect probabilistic mathematical physics. According to the bulletproof logic the universe gives us, if it's observable, it's mathematical. And that's why Schrodinger came up with his equation. If there is a wave, there will always be a function to describe its geometry. And that strongly hints at us being resembling at least a computer program. Which might, that actually might shut down the free worlds, and the, the, not free, that might shut down free will, but that, I was thinking about that, but that might shut down the many worlds interpretation. 
And it also implies that time passing is just the space and particle interactions rendering themselves in real time. Or fake time, I should say. But and that also means there's a second time dimension, because there's there there's the hyper being type of the time dimension. But it's completely unobservable. I mean what else what else could it be though, you know? Maybe for for their computer it's real time. And maybe for us it's fake time. But I'm not feeling that one just yet. Uh, maybe next time. Actually, not next time. I've lost interest in physics and math. Thank you, public schools, for, for killing my curiosity. And by the way, I'm actually rushing right now. I know I said a lot, but everything I'm saying is actually just scratching the surface of my full theory. And I, all my other theories, all my other contributions that I've made, I know I've said much, much less, but that's because I can get, um, get it understood and get it through with far fewer words and I've thought about all of them quite a bit more so I can be a lot more concise with it um but this is not one of those things that I'm so sophisticated on this is not one of those I'm not a man of few words when it comes to science if you're if you're actually a man of few words that means you know what you're talking about but yeah this is this whole this whole theory is just it's just scratching the surface of the giant iceberg that is not only what I wrote, but it's it's scratching the surface of the giant iceberg that's all of physics in a single theory. And that includes everything from the, the from the giant gargantuan filaments that make up the cosmos um that can form a general relativity and gravitational waves all the way down to the quantum particles that we aren't even sure if they're operating in three dimensions or 11 dimensions. We still have no idea. We have no clue, first of all, why we can only access three dimensions if 11 dimensions are possible. Even though the universe itself seems to have no problem showing us that there are particles interacting in higher dimensions, it just doesn't let us experience it. Nobody has any clue why this happens. I mean, we could tell how it happens, but nobody has any clue why, other than the universe is a giant troll. Like, your guess about the theory of everything is just as good as the world's most educated scientist on the cutting edge's guess. guess. Ultimately, I tried to come up with the Aether Theory. And that's the name that it was going to be. That was what I was going to name it. There's like string theory, there's M theory, F theory. F's in all the chat for all the, um, for all the theory interpretations that died. And there's a bunch of other like quantum loop gravity theory and stuff like that. Uh, the field theories, though, they really, they hooked me. Nobody gave a shit about them. And still, to this day, nobody does. Um... A lot of people, a lot of people are really into quantum loop gravity now, I think. But I remember at the time, every single headline was always trying to talk about string theory and higher dimensions and multiverse shit, because that's flashy. It gets clicks, and yeah, it's interesting. But it didn't resonate with me the same way that the field theories did. I was never really big on string theory. See, something about the whole idea that. A proton is a set mass, and you can be confident if you t observe a totally different proton somewhere else in the universe, you can be sure it would have the same mass, um, well, as long as they had the same energy. Um, something about that told me that whatever mechanisms controlling the, the creation and sustenance of, of a particle's existence so that they don't decay, as far as we know, protons don't decay. But also, whatever controls the way they interact with each other, like when particles collide and, and they make new particles in the Hadron Collider, whatever happens to these particles operates off of rules that apply everywhere, regardless of the position, time, and space. So it seemed efficient to me to imagine an aether to, to not, not like actually um, consider the universe to be that, but to imagine it. That if, if my imagination can imagine that, then it can probably take me new places and I can discover new things like that. That the, the, 
it would assist me in understanding the, the mechanisms responsible for handling how particles are interpreted by the universe in exactly the same way as each other. So when all these like field theories started popping up, I would see all these scientists on YouTube talk about them and that really drew me in. And it was also more because I was a lazy kid rather than it being and something I prefer to string theory. I actually did kind of prefer string theory. It is a more compelling theory, but see, with string theory, first of all, you have to make a handful of assumptions um, about possibly non-three-dimensional strings. You even, for the most part, I've seen scientists even try to assume what they look like, which seems kind of moronic to me, but... Okay, there is math to establish these these things in string theory. But guys, I was 13. I'm not learning that math. And so without the math, you're forced to make these hella assumptions, by the way. Without math, if you don't learn the math of string theory, you're forced to make crazy amount of assumptions. And then you use those assumptions as a framework to somehow, through some fucking wizardry, explain gravity and integrate gravity into the standard model. Uh, later on, later on, not right now, but you're expected to, I mean, that's, that's kind of the, the natural progression of this, of this sort of thing, right? That's why you make these theories. But like, what the fuck? Like, what the fuck kind of jumping to conclusions bullshit is that? I get that there's math, so you don't have to, but like, without the math, it's, it's, it's an insane leap. Like, if that really is how we figure out the theory of everything, that's boring as fuck. How can you expect curious kids to actually understand and enjoy string theory? I saw equations when I was 13 that took up entire pages and I just noped out that bitch. But with fields, everything is conceptual. It's very easy to understand. Aether is just my word for combining all fields into one. So I would read up on like the symmetry of time and how uh, warping space can cause different kinds of movement to result in time dilation or all this like super symmetry shit we got going on, right? And it was so fun to like piece together this stuff in my, in my head and like hypothesize shit like, oh, what if instead of exotic matter, which may not even exist, may not even be stable enough for it to exist for any long periods of time, anything meaningful, <clears throat> what if instead there exists the exotic field or just another field that n no other scientist is uh, looking at, they're thinking about, you know? Maybe in extreme cases, we can observe our normal matter turn into exotic matter. Maybe um, the ground state of the exotic field pushes other fields out of ground state, other particles out of ground state, thus turning the universe into a, a, a like a perpetual motion machine, preventing the universe from ever truly running out of energy, you know? Maybe that means the human race won't die of heat death like, like a gazillion years from now. Oh boy, wouldn't that be nice? But that's just wishful thinking. It's just shit that made me feel good as a kid. I was talking out of my ass, really. And dark energy took a toll on me emotionally. So imagining the universe as like a sticky jello kind of thing. I, I thought about it and I, I think that was my instinctual coping mechanism. To like simulate our universe as keeping everything like stuck together. I was scared of losing the night sky. Um, even though I won't be around to see it. I was scared of, of looking up at the night sky and seeing through a telescope exactly what I see through my eyes. I was scared of losing uh, the extra uh, worlds out there that you could see with the telescope. I was scared of living in Milk Andromeda and um, this being the world that we're, uh, you know, prison to. 
maybe it was because I was like lonely that I thought of the world this way, like all stuck together kind of. I mean, I could give you good guesses as to why I resonated with this much more than I did like string theory. Like how it seemed way too easy to explain dark matter away with, oh, it's just another frequency of the string. Like dark matter has been a prevailing mystery at the forefront of science for like 80% of my life. And to just explain it away so easily, like just like that? Nah, what about the journey? What about the exploration, huh? I remember, like, I was pretty emotionally stupid back then. Somewhat. I I see where I was coming from, and you know what? I agree. I was more concerned with spending time watching KSI and having crushes on girls and things like that. You think I had time to understand Schrodinger's equation? I'm not doing any of that. I can give you guesses as to why I didn't like string theory, but I really couldn't tell you for sure why. I just didn't. And I, I, I still don't. Oh yeah, and the whole exotic field thing is just me talking out of my ass. Even if we discover more fields, they won't be exotic anymore because we discovered them. If anything, the Higgs field is our exotic field. Um, and, and whenever I say shit like, under extreme cases, like, we've generated pretty damn high temperatures and pretty low temperatures, colder and hotter than anywhere in the universe right now, you know? Right here in, in, in labs. And back when we observed gravitational waves for the first time, that was two black holes colliding. Like, that's about as extreme as anything can get in the universe. I, as far as we know. I will admit, using strings to create understandable and observable, like, superpositions of nature that don't collapse when observed, simply by combining multiple frequencies in a single string, like a headphone driver, um, vibrating faster frequencies inside the lower frequencies to create multiple sounds at once. It's got, it's got merit um, as, a, as a perspective. Like, I don't care if something has merit scientifically. It's got merit in, in, in being something worth thinking about, you know, putting, putting mental energy into. I can't lie, it's, it's actually really compelling to think about that. I just don't like the math that comes immediately after that. I mean, might as well, you know, throw in simulation theory, even though it doesn't really fit in, it's more of a thought experiment. And it's also like an unfalsifiable claim. Like, it, if I create The Sims 2000, right, and I make it so good that the characters develop consciousness, and self-awareness, it doesn't matter how hard they try to uh, creative their way around. Um, ultimately, there's still lines of code. There is no escaping that computer. And there is no figuring out whether or not they truly live in a computer. They will never figure out who I am. They will never know what kind of hardware they're running on. So simulation theory can loosely be thrown in, into the mix um, but less is a theory and more of an abstract thought experiment because it's it's a dead end. And I'm only throwing it in because I have no shame as, as a scientist. But I think that's make that's what makes me a good scientist. Like, fuck the appearances. Just consider it at least. My contribution was going to be Aether theory. A-E-T-H-E-R. Like, for example, early physicists, I looked into this, early physicists understood that light was a wave, um, for the most part. But they knew that waves needed a means to propagate. So, like how sound can propagate through the chains of electrons repelling each other, um, 
in, in matter causing compressions in the air or uh, through a, a, flu, a solid or whatever, you know, just through objects, through, through matter. Essentially, a delivery from one part of an object to another part of an object. It needs to propagate through something, though. The information needs to, to have some means of propagation. And just like sound, light must also have a means of propagation. Some kind of cosmic aether that exists everywhere. And that's what people thought um, for a while. It was actually a pretty prevailing idea that uh, there is this cosmic aether everywhere. I don't think they called it aether, though. And then the fucking juggernaut Einstein decided to just casually explain light and how it can move in a vacuum. And uh, as a result, he just like one shot collateral all other physicists. Fucking Grim Reaper. But maybe, maybe, just maybe, the, the correct way of looking at the universe is it's all aether. Like, uh, like glowstone and water. Never mind. Maybe, though, slippery slope, maybe Einstein's interpretations were just a very far separated, but pinpoint accurate observation that works for sure and conforms to physics to a T, but maybe it isn't the best perception, right? That's the, like, that's my style of doing things. It's perception. Maybe. Nah, I'm, I, I don't want to doubt Einstein, honestly. That's a bit of a daunting task. I don't need all the dick writing stands, physicists coming after me on Reddit trying to like pin me up against Einstein. There's no point. I'm not even involved in physics anymore. This isn't my fight. Oh, and just like how I said my, my theory was scratching the, the surface of the full extent of physics. Bro, do you have any idea how many bullet points I wrote down that I wanted to incorporate into my Aether theory, but I had yet to do? Like, I'm, I have yet to take into account the fact that physics stops working when it gets too hot, which means that whatever fundamental formula you come up with needs to work even during those extreme conditions where all other physics fails. But if we live in a simulation, this could simply be the computer overheating and throttling these, uh, these tasks one at a time. Um, so that way time could actually pass without bottlenecking. Um, and it would, it would allow the more important tasks to keep going on. Like, I don't know, existing, the same way like a smart game would render less textures to raise frame rate back up. Um, or like how you can get rid of laggy chunks filled with um, lag, lag machines, pistons and furnaces on, on, in Minecraft to bring the TPS back up to normal in 2v2t. Well, I mean, normal for 2v2t is like 3 TPS, but still, it's better than 1. But... Think about this, if this computer really is overheating, it could actually be impossible to determine the theory of everything if we really do live in a simulation. Because that's an error on the part of our creators. It would be like the Sims characters trying to determine the laws of our universe just by observing the physics of their universe. Like even if they figure it all out, it's not happening. No matter what they do, it's entirely up to us. I'm no scientist. My theory is really rudimentary. And I didn't actually think this through all that much. People were just really impressed that a 13-year-old thought this up. If I proposed this when I was 18, nobody would have cared. I also have to take into account bruh momentum, angular momentum like I mentioned earlier, which like... Even nowadays, I still think about it's still a, a complete mystery to me. Nobody else seems to have any issues with it but me. Everybody acts like it's totally okay for a figure skater to just bring their arms in and just spin faster 
without being pushed to spin faster. Like, what the fuck? I can't wrap my head around that one, dude. Let alone jam into some DIY theory that the universe is jello. And that the laws of physics are indistinguishable from each other. I also have yet to take into account the fact that our words force us to call things names that are similar to the phenomena that we explore on a human scale, like waves and particles, when it's likely that the actual phenomena don't have words yet created to describe them. I mean, if we had a word to describe um, particles that are pretty likely to exist but not certain, that were guided by randomized, unobservable pulses of calculus-based likelihood pockets in the in the form of reality, if we could come up with some vocab words for that, then we wouldn't have this whole wave-particle duality in the first place. It's a product of language. And that would have actually saved me quite a lot of frustration. That shit pissed me off, dude. Like, I could not understand that. I remember when I was little, I would actually, like, my mom would read me the um, popular science magazine website as a bedtime story. And um, one time I was like, I told my mom, I was like, like, enough, read me like a Disney story. Because I was like so frustrated in my head. I couldn't wrap my head around these like things because it wasn't because I couldn't understand them. I understood them. It was because I couldn't understand the language because I sucked at like reading. And so I was like, read me some actual normal stories instead for once. Like, these these things are, we're very, very influenced by the language that we speak. For example, these um, electrons are supposed to be like particles, right? But then they're also waves. Like, we observe them and we go like, aha, a particle. And then we look away for a, a second and it acts like a wave. Like, what? Make up your mind. And the electron's like, oh, trust me, bro, trust me, I'm a particle. The, the function is just probabilistic. Trust me, I'm not a wave, I'm a particle. No scam at all, trust me. And I'm like, really? Then fucking act like it. Shit pisses me off, dude. Like, it's humbling to think about. I was so mad then, but it's like, I'm a human with human needs and human desires. And the universe is under no obligation to make sense to me. I need to consider that. I need to consider the extremes. Like, black holes need to make sense of my theory, which they do. Um, I got that one down, but so does the Big Bang, which doesn't really make sense in my theory. I, I haven't figured that one out. And and probably stuff before the Big Bang, too. I need to, I need to do all of that, like, theoretically. We're not going to be able to figure that one out, but I... I, I didn't spend any time hypothesizing what happened before the Big Bang, which I should have done. So, I also need to consider those little, uh, those little neutrino fuckers, right? Goddamn contrarians. Those are these scientific contrarians. I also have to take into account dark matter, which I conveniently left out of my theory, even though I explained dark energy. But some... Simulation theories have actually had a pretty good explanation for dark matter. Um, but I also have to consider what happens at absolute zero. Like, the hotter you get, the more wonky physics gets. But that also happens when it gets really, really cold. Like, when you get really close to absolute zero, like one or two degrees away, fluids lose all of their sense of cohesion and adhesion. They become like a, like a ghost, basically, with zero viscosity. It's just like, it isn't even a, a fluid anymore. It's just chilling. No pun intended. Actually, pun halfway intended. But it's just chilling there as if it were like a bunch of loose particles with no friction. Even, even fluids have friction, but at, at very, very cold temperatures, they just lose all of that. They become like a, like a not a super fluid. Like, you know how when it's really hot, 
the macro laws fall apart. When it's really cold, the quantum laws fall apart. Like particles form large singular particle entity um, entities, large ones. Like as if, as if the wave pulses in these fields that exist in space-time being interpreted as particles are no longer restricted by these um, conditions, by like common sense, and they could just merge into one giant wave pulse without any resistance and like a constructive interference cloud of like pure quark gluon matter. And the entire concept of an observable particle at that point would just dissolve and everything everything becomes this at a very cold enough temperature actually this quantum mush like right next to absolute zero but how the fuck am i supposed to incorporate that into my theory that makes no sense i'm telling you guys i'm i'm good at talking like i can sound smart with all the stuff i said but I really haven't actually thought about it that much. Like my theory has a ton of holes and it only takes into account like maybe 0.1% of physics, maybe if even that. I also have no fucking clue how elasticity works on a quantum level. Um, I can take an intuitive guess based on like macro elasticity, but intuition doesn't seem to match up very well. It doesn't seem to transfer over to stuff in the in the quantum world. I also never got the chance to incorporate paradoxes. I was going to, because I love that. I'm interested in that. Um, I just never got around to it. I didn't get the time. You know, I was busy, like, watching YouTubers and, uh, you know, playing video games and stuff. Also, the way light affects electrons and energy states is something I had heard about. At that point, later on, actually, but I never really got the chance to look deep into it. Like, I still have no idea how things can be transparent. That shit makes no sense to me. I don't, I don't get it. I don't get how a, a 100 thin sheet of gold atoms can be more opaque than blackout curtains, but how a, a crystal, like a diamond-like crystal can be clear. I, I, it doesn't make sense to me. I also have to take into account all of the fields of the universe, all of the, the states, <clears throat> all of the universe's potential energy and the, the um, dispersion of that. And if quantum tunneling still applies after true heat, de heat death, and what that means, because if quantum tunneling um, is, is in large part activation energy for particles, then what the hell would the activation energy be for? It's not like you can burn ash again. If, if quantum tunneling would be able to spon spontaneously create new layers above ground state, if that's wish fulfillment thing, if that's wish, wishful thinking or not, I, I don't know. I would also have to take into account the fact that heat death itself, which is very scary to, to think about by itself, let alone study. I, I, I have to take into account the fact that that's a, that's a thing. Would a, would a, a, a being creating a simulation in, in the image that we're in right now, would they truly allow for that to happen? And also, Hawking radiation is so fucking hard to understand, dude. Like, I don't understand that shit. Like, that is the most counterintuitive shit I've ever heard. Like, bro, ripping apart virtual particles, eating up one of them as the other one leaves into the universe, right? Thus... Um, conserving energy and getting smaller. Wouldn't it get bigger, though? Because it's not like the virtual particles are just matter that comes from nowhere. In my, like, 
in my original theory, virtual particles are just the very, very minor, um, very tiny crusts of the wave, of the waves that constantly, like, that this, like, wavy 3D jello aether everywhere constantly exhibits. And let's say you were to imagine it as particles. When when they don't exist, right? When when it's when space is just when these fields are completely flat, there's no waviness in them, right? No no pulsing. Then there just exists this evenly distributed energy in space. And like what the hell else is it gonna be exactly? If you if you describe it as these like absolutely miniature antimatter explosions between particles that are too small to even call particles, right? It's just a, a fragment of antimatter and matter um, coming into existence and going out of existence at the same time or, or in extremely quick succession, like Planck time succession. Um, and it's happening all the time, everywhere. If you're going to say that, then that means that you take this piece of this wave, of this crest of energy, one of the particles is now, has been eaten by the black hole, one of them has escaped the black hole. They both existed, but now one particle is gone, and there's less energy in the rest of the universe, and now one particle is inside the event horizon. So wouldn't that mean that that part of the energy was eaten? thus making the black hole bigger. Also, I thought, if this is how Hawking radiation works, then wouldn't, wouldn't Hawking radiation apply faster um, the b bigger a black hole is due to the um, larger surface area and greater likelihood for um, virtual particles to get uh, split up by the event horizon of a black hole? Wouldn't that be the case? Why is Hawking radiation um, quicker when a black hole is smaller? Because of instability? Then I, I just, I don't get it. Hawking radiation, I, I, I fail to understand it. Because, okay, you could say, well, black holes are not absolute zero. You know, they, they are a bit hotter than absolute zero. So when the universe reaches heat death, and um, we're at this state of absolute zero, well, very, very close to it, black holes will emit out their energy, as, th as everything does, and they'll slowly lose energy and get smaller and smaller and smaller. But what if black holes are absolute zero? Like, you ever stop to consider that one? Like, what else would they be? They, they don't let light escape. They literally, there's no, there's no energy emission that they have. But apparently it gets smaller with Hawking radiation. Like, what, what the fuck's going on in Miami? This shit just disappeared. And also, if we do live in a simulation, some people say that, like, Irrational numbers don't make sense because there's no way the creators of a simulation could ever have the time or resources to fully type out irrational numbers. Putting to the side that the concepts of time and resources don't even need to exist in other universes, and that for all we know, other universes with other laws could actually allow you to fully type out rational numbers. Who knows? They could have irrational number generators, they could have actual true perpetual motion, they could have, I mean, even the words motion or perpetual may not make sense in these other universes, th these higher universes. Time could be, could be a, a, a non-factor of this. Who knows, what if they do have the time? What if they have all the time in the world? What if in their universes, infinity is actually not something that you get if you messed up in your equations and actually just a part of their physics. And they do, they could have all, an infinite amount of time to type out fully rational numbers. But 
putting all that to the side, all that, like, computers can generate irrational numbers. Like, they can write them down. They can generate them as they go and, and round up or down based on um, some kind of, some kind of uh, 64-bit, 32-bit, whatever. They can round them off of a small defined observable distance or observable time scale, you know, like Planck time or Planck length. But really, that's lazy. That's lazy on my part. I, I just mental gymnastics the Planck equations into my theory by saying not only does our universe have a frame rate, speed of light, C, it also has a pixel resolution, the Planck length. I didn't even bother to learn what the Planck length was. I just connected it as if it fit the puzzle. However, from what I've understood, actually, even shortly after I made the theory, the Planck length isn't even the smallest unit anything could be, but rather it's the smallest unit that we can measure, which is totally different. Like that takes me further into a traditional science and pulls me out of the realm of abstract thinking. And I know for this sort of thing, I'm going to need to focus hard on abstract thinking and abandon everything that we know about the universe as it is right now. There really is nothing stopping a particle from being smaller than the Planck length. There's just no way for us to ever observe that. So my reasoning here made actually made no sense. Like there's flaws in, in my theory. We, we need better ways to describe quantum vocab words because language is one of the biggest, maybe the biggest hindrance in our progress to achieve the, the pointless goal of knowing an equation that we can never do anything with. Other than to finally, you know, end the god of the gaps. What a giant fucking waste of time. It's like using a flamethrower to kill an ant. Like, that's overkill, bro. Whatever the theory of everything is, it's not all that, um, maybe it isn't. I, saying something is not important is, is another slippery slope because if that's, like, nothing's important if that's the case. But this, this theory, I don't have the brain to figure it out. That was my actual contribution. I tried hard enough to know for sure just how little I actually know, and I can't imagine it's necessary to understand the universe intuitively for you to figure out the theory of everything. I just like understanding everything intuitively. Because if I can't understand it, there's no point in it for me. If the science isn't fun, it's not worth doing. And the neural pathways needed to simulate the universe in its truest form, are probably not even not even neural pathways that you can develop simply with learning and conditioning, as bad as it sounds, if it's even possible. It's probably going to come down to someone being born for the job, like not someone working hard for it. It's going to take a, a natural-born prodigy, maybe more. You're probably going to need either some biological enhancement slash deficiency depending on what you'd call it like how um it's believed that isaac newton had asperger's and how you get autistic savants and that sort of thing or maybe um a neural implant neuralink nanotechnology rewiring your brain you know connecting your temporal lobe to your hippocampus and your medulla to your prefrontal while we're at it and you know generate new corpus callosum silk to connect all the parts of your brain together while snipping the corpus that connects left and right. Honestly, it's probably, it's probably going to take a, a brain that we've never even seen before, a completely alien brain to any other human that's ever lived, to understand the theory of everything, to actually, not to figure it out, but to understand it in their own head. There's probably... If I were to guess, there's probably biological limitations we have at the moment. Or maybe that's just an excuse. I, I don't even know. It's not like I have any interest in this stuff anymore. 
And besides, I'm a bit too late to uh, radically change the way I think. I'm 21, so it's not like I have that much fluid intelligence left to go around. At least not the, you know, the plasticity buffet that I had when I was three years old, when I actually started doing math. My mom told me I was doing it before that, but I don't remember. So I don't know if he's telling the truth or not. She might have just told me that just to make me feel good. But I remember being three and, and thinking that adding and subtracting were super fun to do in my head. And I remember teaching myself how to multiply numbers when I was four, um, simply by looking at my brother's homework and watching how he did it. Like, my mom was helping him with it. I would overhear, I, I would be running around playing with toy cars. I'd overhear them. And over like the course of like a couple hours of um, running around in my cars and hearing them sporadically throughout that time, like they would say this times this equals this. And I would just think about it. And I made the connection in my own head. So maybe I could have figured this out. Maybe I couldn't have. I'm pretty sure I couldn't have. I suspect that in order to create a fundamental formula for the nature of reality, you would need to create a completely new set of physical laws entirely different to the one we have now. Because a fundamental Occam's razor formula that is the core, it needs to apply everywhere, all the time. Even when there is no where and when to apply, even inside black holes, not just around or on black, not, not like hairy dog theorem or whatever, it needs to apply inside black holes, touching the singularity. It needs to combine the biggest in general relativity and the smallest in the quantum realm. Virtual particles disobey momentum laws. Like, you'd be hard-pressed to, to find them even accidentally obey momentum laws. Momentum is kind of thrown out the window at this scale, actually. Like, things just, like, do shit. And even calling them particles is a bit of a stretch. Because we don't know if small particles, like, particles that small, even really exist in three-dimensional reality. Like, they're too small to determine the size of. They could very well be one-dimensional dots contained in uh, particle fields as like pockets of energy and they collapse from superposition into a rendered particle upon interaction with like a photon or something maybe the higgs field is having some rendering errors and that's what's behind all this dark matter bullshit but that's just a lazy way of chalking things up for all we know though during the big bang space-time may not even exist as we know it today. The universe is probably opaque, and actually the universe was definitely opaque and not transparent like it is now. And the forces of nature, like gravity and electromagnetism and nuclear forces, and even the fundamental constants, they may not have been uh, set in stone. At the, they may have been written right there, like forged in the fires of hot matter soup like the same way we run the random simulations over and over and over again and there's slight alterations every time the process is is loading just like in that loading process where the computer generates the formulas um for the for the based on the algorithm for simulation to follow again compiling that code into something machine readable could be our could be analogous to like what the Big Bang is to us, to them. Like the Big Bang could have been the process of our computer, like our program, just being compiled into machine code. And the laws of physics could have not been set in stone in the universe until it cooled off into something more stable and, uh, you know, programs were actually compartmentalized. And maybe small changes in these initial conditions, because there were initial conditions. Like, don't get it fucked up. The universe was not homogenous in the beginning. Maybe 
ever so slight changes though could have drastically changed the laws and constants that our universe uses. Like if, if we were to run millions of simulations on our computers for some machine learning thing, each time it would happen, the computer would expend a lot of energy, it would get hotter as it randomizes these initial parameters, right? And that could have just been the Big Bang, the randomization. Actually, the universe isn't supposed to exist. By all logic, it shouldn't. Like, you ask, okay, what created the universe? Well, membranes crashing together to create bubbles in the cosmic void. Okay, we jumped like 10 steps, okay? Just to save some time. But what created that? Um, God? Okay, what created that? How does something create itself without first existing? Existence is a logical fallacy according to our purest logic. Nothing should exist. God damn, what a mistake for apes to try to understand the universe. We should have stuck to eating fruits off trees and hunting buffalo with spears to feed our tribes. That's honestly how this shit makes me feel, dude. I feel like this was a mistake. Like, as we dig deeper and deeper and deeper into the rabbit hole, eventually we're going to dig ourselves into hell. This shit is frustrating. I remember I didn't have any problems with this when I was little. But now now that I, I, I'm, like, disgusted by heavy math, it it's painful to think about. You go, you go far back in, um, in, in the scientific journey of the individual and you have these, you know, unanswered questions when you're a kid. And you know what else? If you're making a theory of everything, you probably also need to include these questions as well. These questions that um, that we just ignore when we're adults. Like, do you guys realize how, how tremendous of a task that is? To be the person that cracks the codes of the universe, it's going to take much more than being good at math and being good at observation. It's going to take a whole new level of cognitive ability and attention to detail. Uh, it's, it's, it would be like an impossibly unique perspective. Actually, not even just a unique perspective. It would need to be a perspective so novel that it would be j no less novel than someone being able to simulate what death is like in their own head, what non-existence is like. Because if you simulate the core of existence, then you should be able to simulate non-existence too. No problem. The true genius of people like Tesla is the way they thought about nature. It was synesthesia, and I have synesthesia too. I have it for uh, sound and color. I don't ever talk about it. It gets really annoying. I'm not publicizing this. It's, it's, it's frustrating having to, people know about it. They, they knew about it in um, elementary school, and it was, it was annoying explaining it to people over and over and over again. They keep asking me, oh, what colors do I see? What colors do I see? And um, nowadays, I just don't tell anyone I have it. I only mention it when I, I feel like it's worth mentioning um, to very specific people in those, like, you know, romantic moments type deal. But it's a different thought process that I have. And it's, it's deep. It's, it's nature. It's intrinsic. It's not something I really have any control over. And, like... Tesla had some understanding of this on a different scale. He had synesthesia for frequencies and energy. Tesla understood the world in a way that was not close to what anybody else had thought of at that time. And that type of synesthesia is probably one in a trillion. Like most humans perceive the world in the same way. And even the synesthesia that I have is, it's not, it's not uncommon. 
for the longest times, people perceive rocks and stone as eternal. So they carved into them to immortalize their souls. Imagine the different way that a kid perceives a board of wood versus a strong man. Like the strong man in his head, probably intuitively, like his, his monkey brain probably looks at a piece of wood and naturally, without him ever like having any voluntarily control, voluntary control over it, probably thinks of it as like little like flakes of chips that are just connected together by a, a, a force that can be broken. But a kid who climbs trees probably looks at that same piece of wood and imagines it to be indestructible. As Spongebob said, it's our imagination. It's suspension of disbelief in real life. It's belief. Tesla wasn't a genius because he was good at math. Anyone can be good at math if their parents forced them to be good from a young age. Pythagoras wasn't a genius because he was really good at math. Well, he was, but his perception of the world was also crazy warped from, from the normal perception. He even has this quote. Um, it's one of my favorite quotes of all time. It's like, physical matter is just music solidified. Like, bro, that's some, that's some Tumblr shitpost type, type stuff. If Tumblr actually had intelligent people, like instead of them going like, oh, bricks are just domesticated rocks wasting their goddamn time. Like, nah, physical matter is just music solidified. It took me years to understand what that truly means. And that quote alone, it would take so long for me to explain it to people in the way that I understand it now. Because the way I learned to perceive the world, just to understand that quote, is so far off from the norm. Like the same words will have different meanings to me versus to non-physics interested normies. Simply because of the amount of conditioning I've put on my perception. Perception is everything. I told you guys about our perception of clouds. How our... Our quick brain looks at clouds at a glance and just assumes what they must feel like and even taste like if you have any imagination in you. It only makes sense. But imagine an animal that thinks very slowly, right? They probably perceive time way slower than we do. And thus their perception... Their perception of clouds are probably more like what they look like in a time lapse, violently shifting and swirling and sloshing and moving, more like a vape cloud on a human scale, right? Like, they probably imagine the sky as a blender and the clouds are a shake inside the blender, never being in the same position for too long, unstable, chaotic, they probably imagine clouds as we imagine waterfalls. Perception is everything here. Albert Einstein wasn't a genius because he got good grades in math, which he did, by the way. It's a myth that he did poorly in school. That literally makes no sense. He was doing advanced calculus when he was a preteen, all right? But because he was, that's not what made him a genius. Be, all of these people who were good at math, being good at math did not make them a genius. That was just a byproduct. What made Einstein a genius was his perception of matter and energy and space and time. He imagined gravity in a different way than most people. And space different from most people. We imagine space and time as different. But, you know, when I walk 10 steps forward, I think... I'm not traveling through time. Well, Einstein didn't see it that way. And his perception, turns out, was actually much closer to the truth than the rest of ours. Moving is time traveling. Existing is time traveling. And not just like going forward in time. I mean the gravity exertion that you have on yourself 
warps space-time around you slightly and slows down time for you. Because of our life experiences, though, and sensory input, we don't perceive it like this. Even mathematicians who understand Einstein's equations, they still don't perceive the world like this. And that's why I don't participate in traditional science, because these guys always have this attitude like, oh, your senses and your perception are the word, are like the devil incarnate, you know? They're wrong, and uh, even if they are wrong, they're like, oh, the scientific method of experiments, rationality, and observation will help us figure out the truth. And yes, technically, they're right. But being technically right doesn't make you actually right. Personally, I think that's a really boring way of doing science. I'm... I'm more of a fan of changing how you imagine nature of the, the nature of reality to be to to match quantum loop theory or, or einstein's theory of relativity and these scientists go like yeah i perceive time and space as separate but when i'm when i experiment when i'm in the lab i make sure to take into consideration that they're one and the same i don't like that i mean like yeah you do what you want right but i think that shit's for squares and losers the based way of doing it would be to force your brain to perceive time and space as one and then see how you perceive the rest of the world because of it. Fucking atheists don't want to expend any mental effort. They just go like, yep, our senses mean nothing. Science is the only answer. Like, where's the challenge in that? It's boring as shit. Try to use your brains, people. I tried to do this. I only had a little bit of success. Not really all that much. But I at least know that I've fallen into Dunning-Kruger's Valley. Which means I know enough to know how much everyone bullshits and how little they actually know about science. At one point, I thought about um, going forward and actually writing something about this this whole theory that I have, with more of a greater emphasis on the simulation theory. In particular, so I could pull off some tomfoolery and piss off a bunch of physicists by walking them through a line of logic that concludes with some bullshit like, if light from an object never reaches an observer's eyes, then the object doesn't exist. Or some fucking malarkey like that, you know? Some shit that would get me banned from Reddit as a whole. Science is so political now, and I hate it because of that. I was into science, but I was still a troll. But here's the thing. With the simulation, you kind of have to assume that things are the way they are for simple reasons. If that makes any sense. Like, for example, my perception on photons basically makes them the ultimate arbitrator of universal justice and light and gravity don't operate independently however for anyone who only studied physics in school light electricity magnetism they're all the same thing it's all em waves in my theory I mean, my hypothesis. Light and gravity are the same thing. And my dumbass didn't make that connection until it was too late. I never realized when I was 12 that a true unifying equation would not only need to consider the forces of electromagnetism and gravity, it would need to consider the fact that those forces are the same force. Yeah, good fucking luck with that one, bucko. Unifying relativity and and um, quantum mechanics is already a, a task beyond comprehension for someone like me. A unifying different forces, distinctly different forces that act seemingly independent from one another. I mean... I don't know. I was I was in way over my head. 
I was not in the depths of Zonning Kruger's trench like I am now. And I'm not the first person to ever think about this sort of thing. Actually, I was kind of late to the party on that one. I mean, bro. Like, literally, gravitational waves move, move at the speed of light. Like, you know what else, what, you know what else moves at the speed of light? Light! How could I not make that connection? Like, why? I'm looking back at it. I was really, really foolish at the time. I was in way over my head. And like, it's so obvious now, right? But I couldn't really comprehend it back then. I thought that what I was thinking was profound. I still can't comprehend it, actually. I don't know, not just back then. I'm no Einstein, all right? But I realized, the main thing I realized is that if I was to do this, especially if I was going forward with simulation theory as like a part of the foundation, then I would have to combine two fundamental forces that are so inexorably different. I knew I couldn't comprehend that. And as far as I'm concerned, science is a waste of time if you can't comprehend it. Like, science for scientists' sake is stupid. The only science worth doing is science that's fun. It took me two years to imagine a four-dimensional world. Imagine how long it would have taken me to combine gravity and EM. Like, bro, I would have lost all my fluid intelligence by the time. Like, by, I was 13 years old. My brain was already less plastic than, than the fucking ocean, alright, than the fucking straws in LA. I never actually wanted to dedicate my entire cognitive prime to quantum physics, alright? Even then, I never even fully bothered to understand Schrodinger's equation. So, like, you can see why I gave up on it. And, dude, I have to also room temperature superconductors. My fucking god, dude. Actually, that could be it. Like, when I heard, um, pretty recently, that we found a room temperature asterisk superconductor, that was the first time in my life where I thought, like, oh, this could be it. This could be the key to unlocking the theory of everything. This could be a theory to finally cracking, dare I say, perpetual motion. I never thought that way before, um... I, not when we got the picture of the black hole, not when we detected gravitational waves, not when we thought neutrinos move faster than light that one time. Nothing. Nothing made me think this way, but superconductors, room temperature superconductors, oh my fucking god. And nobody ever talks about them. Like, you go on YouTube and you look up black holes and you'll see billions of views. But you look up superconductor technology... Shit that's happening on Earth right now, nobody gives a fuck. Like, if things go the way that scientists think it'll go, room temperature superconductors will be the most important of the, the most important invention of the 21st century. Literally up there with computers, the wheel, fire, like all... You cannot underestimate how impactful they can be. How much they can change the world. All these businessmen, these like venture capitalists, like Shark Tank guys and all that stuff, they want to like find out the technologies that will lead the world to the future. Underrated technologies. They want to invest in the next, uh, the next dot com, whatever, you know. The next technology revolution, if I was a betting man, it's room temperature superconductors. That's what you invest in. That's how you get irrigation to every human on earth for the lower class. That's how you get computers that are 1% in the price, yet a trillion times the speed for the middle class. And that's how you get flying cars and commercial rocket flights to Mars for the upper class. Billionaires all talk about like quantum computing as like the next gold rush. Yeah, if I was the CEO of what would be the next generations like AMD, NVIDIA, Apple... If that's my goal, if I'm going for quantum computing, 
and I'm I'm trying to um to to push Moore's law to its limits with with the new generation of computer architecture. The the correct way of looking at the universe is it's all aether. Like uh like glowstone and water. Never mind. Maybe though it's a little very slow. Maybe Einstein's interpretations were just a very far separated but pinpoint accurate observation that works for sure and conforms to physics to a T, but maybe it isn't the best perception, right? That's the, like that's my style of doing things. It's perception. Maybe nah, I'm I I don't want to doubt Einstein honestly. That's a bit of a daunting task. I don't need all the dick writing stands physicists coming after me on Reddit trying to like pin me up against Einstein. There's no point. I'm not even involved in physics anymore. This isn't my fight. Oh, and just like how I said my my theory was scratching the the surface of the full extent of physics. Bro, do you have any idea how many bullet points I wrote down that I wanted to incorporate into my Aether theory, but I had yet to do? Like I'm I had yet to take into account the fact that physics stops working when it gets too hot, which means that whatever fundamental formula you come up with needs to work even during those extreme conditions where all other physics fails. But if we live in a simulation, this could simply be the computer overheating and throttling these uh, these tasks one at a time. Um, so that way time could actually pass without bottlenecking. Um, and it would it would allow the more important tasks to keep going on, like I don't know existing. The same way like a smart game would render less textures, to raise frame rate back up, um, or like how you can get rid of laggy chunks filled with um, lag lag machines, pistons and furnaces on, on in Minecraft to bring the TPS back up to normal in two v two T. Well, I mean. Normal for 2v2t is like 3 TPS, but still, it's better than 1. But think about this. If this computer really is overheating, it could actually be impossible to determine the theory of everything if we really do live in a simulation. Because that's an error on the part of our creators. It would be like the Sims characters trying to determine the laws of our universe just by observing the physics of their universe. Like, even if they figure it all out, it's not happening. No matter what they do, it's entirely up to us. I'm no scientist. My theory is really rudimentary, and I didn't actually think this through all that much. People were just really impressed that a 13-year-old thought this up. If I proposed this when I was 18, nobody would have cared. I also have to take into account bruh momentum, angular momentum, like I mentioned earlier, which like, even nowadays, I still think about, it's still a, a complete mystery to me. Nobody else seems to have any issues with it but me. Everybody acts like it's totally okay for a figure skater to just bring their arms in and just spin faster without being pushed to spin faster. Like, what the fuck? I can't wrap my head around that one, dude. Let alone jam into some DIY theory that the universe is jello. And that the laws of physics are indistinguishable from each other. I also have yet to take into account the fact that our words force us to call things names that are similar to the phenomena that we explore on a human scale, like waves and particles when it's likely that the actual phenomena don't have words yet created to describe them. I mean, if we had a word to describe um, particles that are pretty likely to exist but not certain, that were guided by randomized, unobservable pulses of calculus-based likelihood, 
pockets in the in the foam of reality if we could come up with some vocab words for that then we wouldn't have this whole wave particle duality in the first place it's a product of language and that would have actually saved me quite a lot of frustration that shit pissed me off dude like i could not understand that i remember when i was little i would actually like my mom would read me the um popular science magazine website as a bedtime story and um one time i was like i told my mom i was like like enough read me like a disney story because i was like so frustrated in my head i couldn't wrap my head around these like things because it wasn't because i couldn't understand them i understood them it was because i couldn't understand the language because i sucked at like reading and so i was like read me some actual normal stories instead for once like these these things are we're very very influenced by the language that we speak for example these um electrons are supposed to be like particles right but then they're also waves like we observe them and we go like aha a particle and then we look away for a, a second and it acts like a wave like what make up your mind and the electrons like oh trust me bro trust me i'm a particle the the function is just probabilistic trust me i'm not a wave i'm a particle no scam at all trust me and i'm like really then fucking act like it this shit pisses me off dude like it's humbling to think about i was so mad then but it's like i'm a human with human needs and human desires and the universe is under no obligation to make sense to me i need to consider that i need to consider the extremes like black holes need to make sense of my theory which they do um i got that one down but so does the big bang which doesn't really make sense in my theory i i haven't figured that one out and and probably stuff before the big bang too i need to I need to do all of that like theoretically we're not going to be able to figure that one out but i i i didn't spend any time hypothesizing what happened before the big bang which i should have done so i also need to consider those little uh those little neutrino fuckers right goddamn contrarians those are these scientific contrarians i also have to take into account dark matter which i conveniently left out of my theory even though i explained dark energy but some simulation theories have actually had a pretty good explanation for dark matter um but i also have to consider what happens at absolute zero like the hotter you get the more wonky physics gets but that also happens when it gets really really cold like when you get really close to absolute zero like 1 or 2 degrees away fluids lose all of their sense of cohesion and adhesion they become like a like a ghost basically with zero viscosity it's just like it isn't even a, a fluid anymore it's just chillin no pun intended actually pun halfway intended but it's just chillin there as if it were like a bunch of loose particles with no friction even even fluids have friction but at, at very very cold temperatures they just lose all of that they become like a like a not a super fluid like you know how when it's really hot the macro laws fall apart when it's really cold the quantum laws fall apart like particles form large singular particle entity um entities large ones like as if as if the wave pulses in these fields that exist in space time being interpreted as particles are no longer restricted by these um conditions by like common sense and they could just merge into one giant wave pulse without any resistance and like a constructive interference cloud of like pure quark gluon matter and the entire concept of an observable particle at that point would just dissolve 
and everything everything becomes this at a very cold enough temperature actually this quantum mush like right next to absolute zero but how the fuck am i supposed to incorporate that into my theory that makes no sense i'm telling you guys i'm i'm good at talking like i can sound smart with all the stuff i said but i really haven't actually thought about it that much like my theory has a ton of holes and it only takes into account like maybe 0.1% of physics maybe if even that I also have no fucking clue how elasticity works on a quantum level. Um, I can take an intuitive guess based on like macro elasticity, but intuition doesn't seem to match up very well. It doesn't seem to transfer over to stuff in the in the quantum world. I also never got the chance to incorporate paradoxes. I was going to because I love that. I'm interested in that. Um, I just never got around to it. I didn't get the time. <laughs> You know, I was busy, like, watching YouTubers and, uh, you know, playing video games and stuff. Also, the way light affects electrons and energy states is something I had heard about at that point, later on, actually. But I never really got the chance to look deep into it. Like, I still have no idea how things can be transparent. That shit makes no sense to me. I don't, I don't get it. I don't get how... Uh, a 100 thin sheet of gold atoms can be more opaque than blackout curtains, but how a, a crystal, like a diamond-like crystal, can be clear. I, 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 it doesn't make sense to me. I also have to take into account all of the fields of the universe, all of the, the states... <clears throat> All of the universe's potential energy and the, the um, dispersion of that. And if quantum tunneling still applies after true heat, de heat death and what that means. Because if quantum tunneling um, is, is in large part activation energy for particles, then... What the hell would the activation energy be for? It's not like you can burn ash again. If, if quantum tunneling would be able to spon spontaneously create new layers above ground state, if that's wish fulfillment, think if that's wish wishful thinking or not, I, I don't. I would also have to take into account the fact that. Heat death itself, which is very scary to to think about by itself, let alone study. I I, I have to take into account the fact that that's a that's a thing. Would a would a a being creating a simulation in in the image that we're in right now would they truly allow for that to happen? And. Also, Hawking radiation is so fucking hard to understand, dude. Like, I don't understand that shit. Like, that is the most counterintuitive shit I've ever heard. Like, bro, ripping apart virtual particles, eating up one of them as the other one leaves into the universe, right? Thus, um, conserving energy and getting smaller. Wouldn't it get bigger, though? Because it's not like the virtual particles are just matter that comes from nowhere. In my, like, in my original theory, virtual particles are just the very, very minor, um, very tiny crests of the wave, of the waves that constantly, like, that this, like, wavy 3D jello aether everywhere constantly exhibits. And... Let's say you were to imagine it as particles. When, when they don't exist, right? When, when, it's, when space is just... When these fields are completely flat, there's no waviness in them, right? No, no pulsing. Then there just exists this evenly distributed energy in space. And like, what the hell else is it going to be exactly? 
if you if you describe it as these like absolutely miniature antimatter explosions between particles that are too small to even call particles, right? It's just a, a fragment of antimatter and matter um, coming into existence and going out of existence at the same time or, or in extremely quick succession, like Planck time succession. Um, and it's happening all the time, everywhere. If you're going to say that, then that means that you take this piece of this wave, of this crest of energy, one of the particles is now, has been eaten by the black hole, one of them has escaped the black hole. They both existed, but now one particle is gone, and there's less energy in the rest of the universe, and now one particle is inside the event horizon. So wouldn't that mean that that part of the energy was eaten, thus making the black hole bigger? Also, I thought, if this is how Hawking radiation works, then wouldn't... Wouldn't Hawking radiation apply faster um, the b bigger a black hole is due to the um, larger surface area and greater likelihood for um, virtual particles to get uh, split up by the event horizon of a black hole? Wouldn't that be the case? Why is Hawking radiation um, quicker when a black hole is smaller? because of instability, then I, I just, I don't get it. Hawking radiation, I, I, I fail to understand it. Because, okay, you could say, well, black holes are not absolute zero. You know, they, they are a bit hotter than absolute zero. So when the universe reaches heat death and um, we're at this state of absolute zero, well, very, very close to it, black holes will emit out their energy as th as everything does and they'll slowly lose energy and get smaller and smaller and smaller but what if black holes are absolute zero like you ever stop to consider that one like what else would they be they they don't let light escape they literally d there's no there's no energy emission that they have <laughs> But apparently, it gets smaller with Hawking radiation. Like, what? What the fuck's going on in Miami? This shit just disappeared. And also, if we do live in a simulation, some people say that like irrational numbers don't make sense because there's no way the creators of a simulation could ever have the time or resources to fully type out irrational numbers. <laughs> Putting to the side that the concepts of time and resources don't even need to exist in other universes. And that for all we know, other universes with other laws could actually allow you to fully type out rational numbers. Who knows? They could have irrational number generators. They could have actual true perpetual motion. They could have... I mean, even the words motion or perpetual may not make sense in these other universes, these higher universes. Time could be, could be a, a, a non-factor of this. Who knows? What if they do have the time? What if they have all the time in the world? What if in their universes, infinity is actually not something that you get if you messed up in your equations and actually just a part of their physics? And they do, they could have all, an infinite amount of time to type out fully rational numbers. But putting all that to the side, all that, like... Computers can generate irrational numbers. Like, they can write them down. They can generate them as they go and, and round up or down based on um, some kind of 64-bit, kind of, uh, 32-bit, whatever. They can round them off of a smallest defined observable distance or observable time scale, you know, like Planck time or Planck length. But really, that's lazy. That's lazy on my part. I, I just mental gymnastics the Planck equations into my theory by saying not only does our universe have a frame rate, speed of light, C, 
It also has a pixel resolution, a plank length. I didn't even bother to learn what the plank length was. I just connected it as if it fit the puzzle. However, from what I've understood, actually, even shortly after I made the theory, the plank length isn't even the smallest unit anything can be, but rather it's the smallest unit that we can measure, which is totally different. Like that takes me further into a traditional science and pulls me out of the realm of abstract thinking. And I know for this sort of thing, I'm going to need to focus hard on abstract thinking and abandon everything that we know about the universe as it is right now. There really is nothing stopping a particle from being smaller than the Planck length. There's just no way for us to ever observe that. So my reasoning here made actually made no sense. Like there's flaws in, in my theory. We, we need better ways to describe quantum vocab words because language is one of the biggest, maybe the biggest hindrance in our progress to achieve the, the pointless goal of knowing an equation that we can never do anything with. Other than to finally, you know, end the God of the Gaps. What a giant fucking waste of time. It's like using a flamethrower to kill an ant. Like, that's overkill, bro. Whatever the theory of everything is, it's not all that, um, maybe it isn't. I, saying something is not important is, is another slippery slope because if that's, like, nothing's important if that's the case. But this, this theory, I don't have the brain to figure it out. That was my actual contribution. I tried hard enough to know for sure just how little I actually know. And I can't imagine it's necessary to understand the universe intuitively for you to figure out the theory of everything. I just like understanding everything intuitively. Because if I can't understand it, there's no point in it for me. If the science isn't fun, it's not worth doing. And the neural pathways needed to simulate the universe in its truest form, are probably not even not even neural pathways that you can develop simply with learning and conditioning, as bad as it sounds, if it's even possible. It's probably going to come down to someone being born for the job, like not someone working hard for it. It's going to take a, a natural-born prodigy, maybe more. You're probably going to need either some biological enhancement slash deficiency depending on what you'd call it like how um it's believed that isaac newton had asperger's and how you get autistic savants and that sort of thing or maybe um a neural implant neuralink nanotechnology rewiring your brain you know connecting your temporal lobe to your hippocampus and your medulla to your prefrontal while we're at it and you know generate new corpus callosum silk to connect all the parts of your brain together while snipping the corpus that connects left and right. Honestly, it's probably, it's probably going to take a, a brain that we've never even seen before, a completely alien brain to any other human that's ever lived, to understand the theory of everything, to actually, not to figure it out, but to understand it in their own head. There's probably... If I were to guess, there's probably biological limitations we have at the moment. Or maybe that's just an excuse. I, I don't even know. It's not like I have any interest in this stuff anymore. And besides, I'm a bit too late to uh, radically change the way I think. I'm 21, so it's not like I have that much fluid intelligence left to go around. At least not the, you know, the plasticity buffet that... I had when I was three years old, when I actually started doing math. My mom told me I was doing it before that, but I don't remember. So I don't know if he's telling the truth or not. She might have just told me that just to make me feel good. But I remember being three and, and thinking that adding and subtracting were super fun to do in my head. And I remember teaching myself how to multiply numbers when I was four, um, simply by looking at my brother's homework and watching how he did it. Like, my mom was helping him with it. I would overhear, I would be running around playing with toy cars, I'd overhear them, 
And over like the course of like a couple hours of um, running around in my cars and hearing them sporadically throughout that time, like they would say this times this equals this. And I would just think about it. And I made the connection in my own head. So maybe I could have figured this out. Maybe I couldn't have. I'm pretty sure I couldn't have. I suspect that in order to create a fundamental formula for the nature of reality, you would need to create a completely new set of physical laws entirely different to the one we have now. Because a fundamental Occam's razor formula that is the core, it needs to apply everywhere, all the time. Even when there is no where and when to apply, even inside black holes, not just around or on black, not, not like hairy dog theorem or whatever, it needs to apply inside black holes, touching the singularity. It needs to combine the biggest in general relativity and the smallest in the quantum realm. Virtual particles disobey momentum laws. Like, you'd be hard-pressed to, to find them even accidentally obey momentum laws. Momentum is kind of thrown out the window at this scale, actually. Like, things just, like, do shit. And even calling them particles is a bit of a stretch. Because we don't know if small particles, like particles that small, even really exist in three-dimensional reality. Like, they're too small to determine the size of. They could very well be one-dimensional dots contained in uh, particle fields as like pockets of energy and they collapse from superposition into a rendered particle upon interaction with like a photon or something maybe the higgs field is having some rendering errors and that's what's behind all this dark matter bullshit but that's just a lazy way of chalking things up for all we know, though, during the Big Bang, space-time may not even exist as we know it today. The universe is probably opaque, and actually the universe was definitely opaque and not transparent like it is now. And the forces of nature, like gravity and electromagnetism and nuclear forces, and even the fundamental constants, they may not have been... Uh, set in stone at the, they may have been written right there like forged in the fires of hot matter soup like the same way we run the random simulations over and over and over again and there's slight alterations every time the process is is loading just like in that loading process where the computer generates the formulas um for the for the based on the algorithm for simulation to follow again Compiling that code into something machine readable could be our could be analogous to like what the Big Bang is to us to them. Like the Big Bang could have been the process of our computer, like our program, just being compiled into machine code. And the laws of physics could have not been set in stone in the universe until it cooled off into something more stable and, uh, you know, programs were actually compartmentalized. And maybe small changes in these initial conditions, because there were initial conditions, like don't get it fucked up, the universe was not homogenous in the beginning. Maybe ever so slight changes though, could have drastically changed the laws and constants that our universe uses. Like if, if we were to run millions of simulations on our computers for some machine learning thing, each time it would happen, the computer would expend a lot of energy, it would get hotter as it randomizes these initial parameters, right? And that could have just been the Big Bang, the randomization. Actually, the universe isn't supposed to exist by all logic it shouldn't like you ask okay what created the universe well membranes crashing together to create bubbles in the cosmic void okay we jumped like 10 steps okay just to save some time but what created that 
Um, God, okay, what created that? How does something create itself without first existing? Existence is a logical fallacy according to our purest logic. Nothing should exist. God damn, what a mistake for apes to try to understand the universe. We should have stuck to eating fruits off trees and hunting buffalo with spears to feed our tribes. That's honestly how this shit makes me feel, dude. I feel like this was a mistake. Like, as we dig deeper and deeper and deeper into the rabbit hole, eventually we're going to dig ourselves into hell. This shit is frustrating. I remember I didn't have any problems with this when I was little. But now now that I, I, I'm, like, disgusted by heavy math, it it's painful to think about. You go, you go far back in, um, in, in the scientific journey of the individual and you have these, you know, unanswered questions when you're a kid. And you know what else? If you're making a theory of everything, you probably also need to include these questions as well. These questions that, um, that we just ignore when we're adults. Like, do you guys realize how, how tremendous of a task that is? To be the person that cracks the codes of the universe, it's going to take much more than being good at math and being good at observation. It's going to take a whole new level of cognitive ability and attention to detail. Uh, it's, it's, it would be like an impossibly unique perspective. Actually, not even just a unique perspective, it would need to be a perspective so novel that it would be no less novel than someone being able to simulate what death is like in their own head. What non-existence is like. Because if you simulate the core of existence, then you should be able to simulate non-existence too. No problem. The true genius of people like Tesla is the way they thought about nature. It was synesthesia. And I have synesthesia too. I have it for uh, sound and color. I don't ever talk about it. It gets really annoying. I'm not publicizing this. It's, it's, it's frustrating having to... People know about it. They, they knew about it in um, elementary school. And it was, it was annoying explaining it to people over and over and over again. They keep asking me, oh, what colors do I see? What colors do I see? And um, nowadays, I just don't tell anyone I have it. I only mention it when I, I feel like it's worth mentioning um, to very specific people in those, like, you know, romantic moments type deal. But it's a different thought process that I have. And it's, it's deep. It's, it's nature. It's intrinsic. It's not something I really have any control over. And, like... Tesla had some understanding of this on a different scale. He had synesthesia for frequencies and energy. Tesla understood the world in a way that was not close to what anybody else had thought of at that time. And that type of synesthesia is probably one in a trillion. Like most humans perceive the world in the same way. And even the synesthesia that I have is, it's not, it's not uncommon. For the longest times, people perceive rocks and stone as eternal. So they carved into them to immortalize their souls. Imagine the different way that a kid perceives a board of wood versus a strong man. Like the strong man in his head probably intuitively like his, his monkey brain probably looks at a piece of wood and naturally without him ever like having any voluntarily control voluntary control over it probably thinks of it as like little like flakes of chips that are just connected together by a, a, a force that can be broken but a kid who climbs trees 
probably looks at that same piece of wood and imagines it to be indestructible. As SpongeBob said, it's our imagination. It's suspension of disbelief in real life. It's belief. Tesla wasn't a genius because he was good at math. Anyone can be good at math if their parents forced them to be good from a young age. Pythagoras wasn't a genius because he was really good at math. Well, he was, but his perception of the world was also crazy warped from, from the normal perception. He even has this quote. Um, it's one of my favorite quotes of all time. It's like, physical matter is just music solidified. Like, bro, that's some, that's some Tumblr shitpost type, type stuff. If Tumblr actually had intelligent people, like instead of them going like, oh, bricks are just domesticated rocks wasting their goddamn time. Like, nah, physical matter is just music solidified. It took me years to understand what that truly means. And that quote alone, it would take so long for me to explain it to people in the way that I understand it now. Because the way I learned to perceive the world, just to understand that quote, is so far off from the norm. Like the same words will have different meanings to me versus to non-physics interested normies. Simply because of the amount of conditioning I've put on my perception. Perception is everything. I told you guys about our perception of clouds. How our... Our quick brain looks at clouds at a glance and just assumes what they must feel like and even taste like if you have any imagination in you. It only makes sense. But imagine an animal that thinks very slowly, right? They probably perceive time way slower than we do. And thus their perception... Their perception of clouds are probably more like what they look like in a time lapse, violently shifting and swirling and sloshing and moving, more like a vape cloud on a human scale, right? Like, they probably imagine the sky as a blender and the clouds are a shake inside the blender, never being in the same position for too long, unstable, chaotic, they probably imagine clouds as we imagine waterfalls. Perception is everything here. Albert Einstein wasn't a genius because he got good grades in math, which he did, by the way. It's a myth that he did poorly in school. That literally makes no sense. He was doing advanced calculus when he was a preteen, all right? But because he was, that's not what made him a genius. Be, all of these people who were good at math, being good at math did not make them a genius. That was just a byproduct. What made Einstein a genius was his perception of matter and energy and space and time. He imagined gravity in a different way than most people. And space different from most people. We imagine space and time as different. But, you know, when I walk 10 steps forward, I think... I'm not traveling through time. Well, Einstein didn't see it that way. And his perception, turns out, was actually much closer to the truth than the rest of ours. Moving is time traveling. Existing is time traveling. And not just like going forward in time. I mean the gravity exertion that you have on yourself warps space-time around you slightly and slows down time for you. Because of our life experiences, though, and sensory input, we don't perceive it like this. Even mathematicians who understand Einstein's equations, they still don't perceive the world like this. And that's why I don't participate in traditional science, because these guys always have this attitude like, oh, your senses and your perception are the word, are like the devil incarnate, you know? They're wrong, and uh, even if they are wrong, they're like, oh, 
the scientific method of experiments, rationality and observation will help us figure out the truth. And yes, technically, they're right. But being technically right doesn't make you actually right. Personally, I think that's a really boring way of doing science. I'm, I'm more of a fan of changing how you imagine nature of the, the nature of reality to be, to, to match quantum loop theory or, or Einstein's theory of relativity. And these scientists go like, yeah, I perceive time and space as separate, but when I'm when I experiment, when I'm in the lab, I make sure to take into consideration that they're one and the same. I don't like that. I mean, like, yeah, you do what you want, right? But I think that shit's for squares and losers. The based way of doing it would be to force your brain to perceive time and space as one and then see how you perceive the rest of the world because of it. Fucking atheists don't want to expend any mental effort. They just go like, yep, our senses mean nothing. Science is the only answer. Like, where's the challenge in that? It's boring as shit. Try to use your brains, people. I tried to do this. I only had a little bit of success. Not really all that much. But I at least know that I've fallen into Dunning-Kruger's Valley. Which means I know enough to know how much everyone bullshits and how little they actually know about science. At one point, I thought about um, going forward and actually writing something about this, this whole theory that I have, with more of a greater emphasis on the simulation theory, in particular so I could pull off some tomfoolery and piss off a bunch of physicists by walking them through a line of logic that concludes with some bullshit like, if light from an object never reaches an observer's eyes, then the object doesn't exist. Or some fucking malarkey like that, you know? Some shit that would get me banned from Reddit as a whole. And science is so political now, and I hate it because of that. I was into science, but I was still a troll. But here's the thing. With the simulation, you kind of have to assume that things are the way they are for simple reasons, if that makes any sense. Like, for example, my perception on photons basically makes them the ultimate arbitrator of universal justice. And light and gravity don't operate independently. However, for anyone who only study physics in school, light, electricity, magnetism, they're all the same thing. It's all EM waves. In my theory, I mean my hypothesis, light and gravity are the same thing. And my dumbass didn't make that connection until it was too late. I never realized when I was 12 that a true unifying equation would not only need to consider the forces of electromagnetism and gravity, it would need to consider the fact that those forces are the same force. Yeah, good fucking luck with that one, bucko. Unifying relativity and, and um, quantum mechanics is already a, a task beyond comprehension for someone like me. A unifying different forces, distinctly different forces that act seemingly independent from one another. I mean, I, I don't know. I was, I was in way over my head. I was not in the depths of Sonning Kruger's trench like I am now. And I'm not the first person to ever think about this sort of thing. Actually, I was kind of late to the party on that one. I mean, bro. Like, literally, gravitational waves move, move at the speed of light. Like, you know what else, what, you know what else moves at the speed of light? Light! How could I not make that connection? Like, why? I'm looking back at it. I was really, really foolish at the time. I was in way over my head. 
And like, it's so obvious now, right? But I couldn't really comprehend it back then. I thought that what I was thinking was profound. I still can't comprehend it, actually. I don't know, not just back then. I'm no Einstein, all right? But I realized, the main thing I realized is that if I was to do this, especially if I was going forward with simulation theory as like a part of the foundation, then I would have to combine two fundamental forces that are so inexorably different. I knew I couldn't comprehend that. And as far as I'm concerned, science is a waste of time if you can't comprehend it. Like, science for scientists' sake is stupid. The only science worth doing is science that's fun. It took me two years to imagine a four-dimensional world. Imagine how long it would have taken me to combine gravity and EM. Like, bro, I would have lost all my fluid intelligence by the time. Like, by, I was 13 years old. My brain was already less plastic than, than the fucking ocean, alright, than the fucking straws in LA. I never actually wanted to dedicate my entire cognitive prime to quantum physics, alright? Even then, I never even fully bothered to understand Schrodinger's equation. So, like, you can see why I gave up on it. And, dude, I have to also room temperature superconductors. My fucking god, dude. Actually, that could be it. Like, when I heard, um, pretty recently, that we found a room temperature asterisk superconductor, that was the first time in my life where I thought, like, oh, this could be it. This could be the key to unlocking the theory of everything. This could be a theory to finally cracking, dare I say, perpetual motion. I never thought that way before, um... I, not when we got the picture of the black hole, not when we detected gravitational waves, not when we thought neutrinos move faster than light that one time. Nothing. Nothing made me think this way, but superconductors, room temperature superconductors, oh my fucking god. And nobody ever talks about them. Like, you go on YouTube and you look up black holes and you'll see billions of views. But you look up superconductor technology... Shit that's happening on Earth right now, nobody gives a fuck. Like, if things go the way that scientists think it'll go, room temperature superconductors will be the most important of the, the most important invention of the 21st century. Literally up there with computers, the wheel, fire, like all... You cannot underestimate how impactful they can be. How much they can change the world. All these businessmen, these like venture capitalists, like Shark Tank guys and all that stuff, they want to like find out the technologies that will lead the world to the future. Underrated technologies. They want to invest in the next, uh, the next dot com, whatever, you know. The next technology revolution, if I was a betting man, it's room temperature superconductors. That's what you invest in. That's how you get irrigation to every human on earth for the lower class. That's how you get computers that are 1% in the price, yet a trillion times the speed for the middle class. And that's how you get flying cars and commercial rocket flights to Mars for the upper class. Billionaires all talk about like quantum computing as like the next gold rush. Yeah, if I was the CEO of what would be the next generations like AMD, NVIDIA, Apple... If that's my goal, if I'm going for quantum computing and I'm, I'm trying to, um, to, to push Moore's law to its limits with, with a new generation of computer architecture and I'm in charge of putting together an all-round R&D budget for everything in quantum computing, right? So I get all bases covered, processor, storage, RAM, which actually may not be needed because storage could in theory, just be fast enough to make RAM obsolete. But um, graphics, as well as like funding different technologies that could allow for uh, small kinds of um, 
non-binary transistors and uh, new kinds of computing architecture at the microscopic um i mean like yeah my microscopic level but figuring out what elements if i was in charge of figuring out these elements that would be used to create hardware that is optimized for different kinds of algorithms different kinds of logic gates lambda calculus which is an absolute must as well as encryption and graphics processing and encryption has to be taken care of pretty damn early otherwise you're setting up a foundation for a hellish future technology landscape but say i'm in that position i'm that ceo and i'm thinking about all these things right i'm developing a budget that covers literally everything in quantum computing if i was making the call like 20% of the budget at least 20 maybe 25% of the budget would go into research and development on room temperature superconductors if you're a billionaire and you want to invest in the new tech revolution that will create supercomputers and solve np problems and base any bit encryption and creates ai generated art and music and movies catered to be exactly what each individual person enjoys and and simulate the weather months in advance years in advance maybe predict virus outbreaks predict uh uh natural disasters cure cancer uh, develop uh nanobots um sp- like uh solar sails all that stuff if you want to be the pioneer that gets the credit for all that stuff then i'd i'd place a few chips on superconductor technology room temperature superconductor technology and if you're an aspiring thinker and scientist and you want to enter a field that's going to guarantee to turn heads in the next 20 50 100 years and you want to get a lot of notoriety for being ahead of your time like if you want to enter a field that's basically guaranteed to snag at least a couple dozen nobel prizes and you want some chances of earning one of those for yourself this is the field you get into in my opinion i'm no expert I'm just a hunch don't take my advice i'm like there's always a risk okay hell it could be it could be possible that room temperature superconductors simply can't exist but if i was a billionaire that's a risk i'd be willing to take for funding the research cuz even the ones that require really low temperatures or uh the pressure of a diamond press they're still super useful and they they still stand to make a fuck ton of money like you can already use supercomputers to create um sensors that can sense single individual photons on their own with deathly precision like you can set up some insane camera sensor setups with it i'm talking about detecting photons i'm like individual not not light from a scene and then piecing it together with ai no i'm talking about detecting lasers from space detecting flashes in neutrino collisions detecting motion right extremely um rudimentary night vision or thermal vision but extremely powerful i could go on and on but in general i have no doubt di- no doubt that the energy crisis is coming and it's going to take advantage of superconductor research in the future as well there's a whole new world of technology and not even just the like the world i'm talking about beyond the world like technology to be used in satellites and the moon and mars and for for sending things to distant stars 
I'm not going to talk too much about this. All I'm going to say is, like, if this works the way scientists think it'll work, it's it's most likely going to usher in the newest revolution of technology and science and medicine and biology and meteorology and archaeology and fucking everything else while we're at it. And by the way, the guys who are really with the shit, who who do their research and they know the potential here, they're already working on R&D. They just keep it on the low key because they don't want other people to get the same idea. They know that this is a very under, underappreciated, underrated uh, area of investment with an extremely high likelihood of making a whole bunch of people uh, billions, trillions of dollars in the future. And they don't want everyone picking up on this and they all hop on the same bandwagon. But everybody who's really in the know, Google, IBM, Microsoft, they've all made quantum computers using, you guessed it, superconductors. Literally, like, they're extremely expensive. And um, they use qubits, so not actual bits. And I don't even know if they run Lambda or not. So it's not like they could ever, like, it's not like they could just eat an entire crypto block in a second, right? Even if they had the compute power, I don't think they're actually designing these computers with um, current decryption usage in mind. Maybe IBM, uh, but I don't think uh, Microsoft and Google are doing that. But I, I think it's far more for the future of their companies, um, for, for more broad usage. I don't know if they've even bothered to um, set up a Turing machine model for them. I know that they can do calculation. They can do other calculation methods that involve like uh, vectors and like superpositions and stuff. But I'm, I'm not sure if they're really capable of doing lambda at their core. They might literally need to just simulate traditional computer memory um, to do it. But yeah, these guys all have heavy investments in the superconductor world. So it's not like nobody's on this shit. It's just that nobody talks about it. And I'm pretty sure from looking at Apple's financials that they aren't in the superconductor business. But it, it makes more sense for them to be in it than like any other company in the world. Like Intel is investing in superconductors. Amazon is. Uh, I'm pretty sure AWS even has a um, basic quantum computing thing now that people can buy, like quantum instances. I know Quanta Computer invests um, in this sort of technology. Alibaba invests in it. A lot of top-end universities. The entire country of China is, uh, well, theorized to be looking into it. They are, but... Look, there's, there's a difference between having substantial, like, definitive proof and knowing that it's true. And I have no doubt that it's, it's because of, because of modern encryption, because every form of encryption that we use today would just dissolve in the hands of a quantum computer that can do true RNG. Apple's already, you know, making their own chips on their own assembly lines now. Like they're too invested in the future of computer hardware to not be in the superconductor business. Maybe they are, and I just don't know it. But I, I, I think they aren't. If I'm not mistaken, they're like one of the only big tech companies that aren't. Not to say I have like foresight in the ranks of Apple leadership, but, and like room, can, room like dude, Take what I'm saying with a grain of salt. Room temperature superconductors may not even have as much potential as I'm making them out to be, right? It's just a hunch that I have. It's just a gut feeling. But it's for sure not talked about enough. Motherfuckers talk about electric cars every two seconds. And like, talk about some big shit for once, you know? Not shit that ends up on the front page of every mainstream, like all trending on Twitter all the time and all stuff. There just there just isn't much money going into research right now. I mean like there's a there's a the millions of dollars, right? But like Tesla's worth a few hundred billion, is it not? 
but if I were to pick, if I were to pick personally, if I were to pick owning Tesla entire in its entirety versus owning all of the current R&D on superconductors, I'd pick the R&D. It's, it's, it's got a lot of money backing it, but relatively speaking, it's not enough. And it's ripe for investors right now. Either there is not enough money being pumped into the research or Tesla is extremely overvalued or possibly both. But one of those, at least one of those statements is true. Who am I to say? I, I don't know. I'd rather not piss off Reddit. Let's move on. I have already pissed off Reddit enough. And honestly, room temperature of superconductors are kind of a touchy subject. I know it's, it's small and most people don't care. But some people, man. Just some, like, I really shouldn't even be talking about this stuff. Because it's risky. Like, I don't want to imply that Einstein may possibly might be kind of sort of a tiny percent chance a little bit wrong, maybe, even though no one's been able to reconcile his theories with the modern ones. But nope, Einstein always has to be 100% right, and anyone who dares question him is a heretic. Even if really what they're trying to do is create new perspectives that fit with Einstein's theories. Nope, not okay. Reddit will have to have a uh, stern talk with you for that one. So yeah, let's move on from that. But it's not even just Reddit. I, I know I, I make Reddit sound really bad. That's because I was a part of the problem. I know how it is. But just the way that these scientific institutions in general and academia operate right now, it's so fucking socialist, bro. We won't get anywhere with this approach. You have to understand how monumental of a task it is to 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 prove in an explainable way that gravity and electromagnetism are the same thing, that tau neutrinos and charm quarks are the same thing, that order and chaos are the same thing, that philosophy and science are the same thing. And honestly, room temperature superconductors are kind of a touchy subject. I know it's it's small and most people don't care some people, man, just some, like, I really shouldn't even be talking about this stuff, because it's risky, like, I don't want to imply that Einstein may possibly might be kind of, sort of, a tiny percent chance a little bit wrong, maybe, even though no one's been able to reconcile his theories with the modern ones, but nope, Einstein always has to be 100% right, and anyone who dares question him is a heretic. Even if really what they're trying to do is create new perspectives that fit with Einstein's theories. Nope, not okay. Reddit will have to have a uh, stern talk with you for that one. So yeah, let's move on from that. But it's not even just Reddit. I, I know I, I make Reddit sound really bad. That's because I was a part of the problem. I know how it is. But... Just the way that these scientific institutions in general and academia operate right now. It's so fucking socialist, bro. We won't get anywhere with this approach. You have to understand how monumental of a task it is to, to, to prove in an explainable way that gravity and electromagnetism are the same thing. That tau neutrinos and charm quarks are the same thing. That order and chaos are the same thing. That philosophy and science are the same thing. Seriously, a theory like this would have to be so profound that it would completely unify science and philosophy, far beyond bridging them, but it would have to make them indistinguishable from one another. And, and the only room left for philosophical thought beyond just understanding the truth of the matter would be thoughts about the human condition regulated to the profession of the storyteller or the musician or artist. Philosopher would become an obsolete title. 
it would take nothing less than for all of the world's philosophers to stop calling themselves philosophers to create this theory. And when I think about it now, I almost feel like ashamed that I spent like four years of my life creating a theory to solve a problem that I don't have the brain to solve. And notice how I said, create a theory, not finish a theory. Aether theory doesn't work. I would have to create it from scratch, actually. Like, I, I did all this because I thought the standard model was ugly. I thought the strong force being explained with gluons was fucking stupid. Like, that's lame. I mean, yeah, it's correct, but it's lame. Like, why do I have to try to simulate that bullshit in my head? At the time... At the time, I didn't know... Dude, I hadn't even learned the Bohr atomic model in school yet. And I was out here trying to... Trying to conceive of the, the math of probability of electron fields in my own head. Like, the, obviously, my theory was going to have plot holes. I just ignored them because I wanted to be, like, a big and famous, like, I wanted to be like Michio Kaku or, like, a Neil deGrasse Tyson, and I wanted to have my own observatory on some iconic mountaintop. And then I wanted that observatory to be, like, sacred after I died and, and for it to, like, stay there, like, uh, like Griffith Park and stuff like that. But, yeah, the theory, if, if I were to go for it, it would have to be made from scratch, and not from scratch, like, it would, I'm talking from, like, you can't do what YouTube philosophers do, where they read, like, a 400 Wikipedia page, um, and, and then, like, a bunch of subreddits, and they find patterns. You need to find patterns in a realm in which observation is literally impossible. To say that you can find patterns in the fabric of reality is an oxymoron. Like, that's a paradox. It's by definition impossible, because anything observable enough to form conclusions about is large, is complex enough and has enough properties to where we can be sure it is still made of smaller building blocks. Anything that we can make conclusions about simply cannot be the foundation of reality. And for someone who was at that point in my life, just then starting to realize how deeply embedded my prior knowledge was up until that point. Like, despite being a kid, I still wasn't 100% malleable. To me, I, I knew it was impossible. It was already too late. Maybe if I had started when I was two rather than three, then it would be different. But I didn't start with two. I started going deep into science when I was five or six years old, when I learned about... um volume displacement and even then i was i was set up for failure like i i had the option to read the principia mathematica i didn't read it i can't even read i still read it at a kindergarten level i this was i was doing it for fun okay that, that that's ultimately what it was and my frustration is coming out now because it wasn't fun most of it was not fun. If any part of theorizing is less fun than playing with the leap pad or the quantum pad, what a great name, quantum pad, and like learning biology facts from the encyclopedia and stuff like that. If any, if any part of this was not as fun as those activities, I didn't want to do it. And I think I had the right motivation as a human but I had the wrong motivation as a scientist. I was, I was set up to fail from the start. The odds that someone will ever figure out the theory of everything is next to none. If that. And my gut is telling me that even if someone can do what Einstein, Newton, and Hawking all failed to do, just my gut tells me that they would never actually truly be able to explain it to anyone else. Like, they could put it into words, maybe, 
but nobody would truly understand it the way they would. They would be like a, uh, a modern-day Socrates-type situation, one-of-a-kind man, a man who knows something nobody else around him could ever understand. He's alone in the knowledge that he can never transfer that to anyone else fully. Or it could be like a Freud-type situation, or, or like a Diogenes-type situation, where people do understand them, but only many, many years after they die. And we start to figure these things out on our own, as a personal journey. The day we figure out the theory of everything is the same day that you can, that all conclusions that can be made become absurdist conclusions. Like saying something like, like, hmm, yes, the floor here is made of floor. Like that's not a meme anymore at, at that point in time, if, if, that's where, if that's to happen. That is an actual scientific contribution in a world where perception becomes the only kind of truth that actually matters. There's a, a, a single objective truth that has been found and there's no more journey left in that in that cause. Not to say that it's not already the case that perception is the only truth that actually matters. Cough, cough, hint, hint. But what truly matters versus what people perceive matters is, is um, well, it's a matter of perception. But that's a topic for a future day. Actually, a past day. I already explained that one on YouTube. It's called Facts Don't Matter. I don't think I uploaded it yet. Oh, shit. I'll upload it soon if I haven't. I mean, I already tell people like that irrationality and rationality don't exist. Like, for example, you can't ever have an irrational fear of something. Because if you fear something, that fear comes from some place. So that so-called irrational fear... The, the irrational part of it is coming from the same place that a rational fear would come from. But because it's not experienced by the majority, it's apparently not rational. But then again, arachnophobia is considered an irrational fear, and most people have some form of arachnophobia. But I'm getting off topic here. My, my contribution when I was 13 was not any of this physics stuff. That was extra. My real contribution when I was 13 was my conclusion that finding the fundamental theory of the universe is not going to come down to whoever works the hardest. It's going to come down to who is the most creative, who can think outside the box. And if humans are incapable of thinking so far outside the box, that we are unable to develop an idea that works for the core of reality, or at least one that other humans are satisfied with, because we're never going to be able to be objective about something so foreign. If we aren't able to simulate that in our own heads, though, then we're never going to be able to understand the universe, no matter what kind of technology or math exists, let alone explain it to others with words. You need to be kind of crazy if you want to figure it out, actually. I mean, after all, the only non-fallible Occam's razor line of logic that can be applied to the universe is that it shouldn't exist. Like, what created the universe? Maybe other beings. What created them? Computers. Maybe other... Uh, other beings created those computers. What created them? Okay, God. What created God? Okay, you're stuck. Technically, the universe shouldn't exist by its own logic. But only losers start their sentences with technically. The logic that exists within our universe isn't sufficient enough to explain anything beyond it. In fact, outside our universe, observers looking in our universe 
may not even qualify it as something that exists to begin with. <laughs> but then again, you can make an Occam's Razor line of logic about yourself and uh, saying, I think, therefore I am, also seems pretty shaved down, if you ask me. If a god exists, he intentionally wired our brains so that we can never fully understand the universe. Holy shit, that's a great quote. Hold on, I'm going to write that down. Damn, I've been writing down so many quotes. I gotta, I gotta write that down. Damn. If a god exists, he intentionally wired our brains so that we could never fully understand the universe. Actually, that's too serious of a quote. Here, okay. Here's, here's the right quote. God really likes to fuck us in the ass whenever we try to reach the liminal point of understanding the fundamental laws of nature. That's a better quote, I think. Put that one up on the wall if you want to. I think there's a less, there's a, a, a smaller quote that, that isn't as grand, but um, I think it actually applies well to what I've been saying earlier, which is, this is, this is one of my favorite, probably my favorite quote that I've heard recently, um, and by recently I mean like the last five years, but definitely one of my favorite quotes, which is, Man suffers because he takes seriously that which God made for fun. But that's the one I put up on the wall. But yeah, honestly, the kind of person to crack the code either doesn't exist or would also be the kind of person you'd find in a mental asylum. I tried to be a genius like Einstein and Newton and Pythagoras and Tesla, but my Aether theory didn't hold up all that well. It's funny because the general idea I had that I couldn't put into words actually very closely resembles the idea of um, spin foam in loop theory, which I found out about way, way later, like 2018. But... Yeah, it didn't go very well. I didn't really have any help. I was a one-man team, and I also got bullied a lot, so I had a lot on my mind at, at that time. I got really tunnel vision on a, a few certain things, like all the black hole stuff, and uh, I, I still, to this day, can hardly read. So back then, I was even worse at communicating with others. I was socially inept, which didn't help me find people to assist me in developing my theory. I didn't get very much support for it. Um, my parents didn't care all that much. Um, I, did get, I did get a bit of support, actually, in school. There were two instances, and both of the instances, both times, they were, uh, the people who assisted me were on the far end of the aut autism spectrum, and I had a tough time being friends with them. Just a lot of challenges. Not excuses, just challenges. I also got distracted every time I thought of a new way to perceive the universe. Because my mind was running wild and I would think of new things and it would contradict Aether Theory. And I, I would have these, these internal conflict. Okay, do I stick with this theory I've been working on for six months? Or do I abandon it and move on to something I know is actually going to show some promise? You know? Like, for example, I spent like two months developing the idea that um, all everything is is just constructive and destructive interference of musical waves. But 
that's just because I liked the buzzword waves. And this to me explained the speed of light, speed of sound, gravitational waves, which fit the theory like a glove, but it distracted me and it took away from my original theory. Oh, and I was 13 going through puberty and I had started to focus heavy on like girls and stuff. So that kind of took a lot of my brain power away from actually developing it. I wasn't on that Giga Chad level of focus at the time. Oh, and school, not to mention school. School punished me for thinking like an individual and trained me as best as they could to, to conform in the way that they wanted me to think. I like to think that they didn't succeed. I don't think in the end that they succeeded, but they still had an impact. So I can totally sound super smart saying all this stuff, but ultimately this, uh, like, this is by far, I don't want to say like I let myself down. I definitely thought of some really cool things. But it's my least favorite contribution that I ever made. It's so incomplete, and it's riddled with holes, and I hate thinking about it. But yeah, it is what it is. I think that's why I spent so long on this one, because I really, I still feel insecure about this failure of a, of a contribution. It's not like a huge, it's not a colossal failure, right? I mean, if I hadn't thought of these theories then the whole year would have gone by 13, I would have been 13 years old, turning 14 years old, and I just, I just wouldn't have thought of anything. But, yeah, I, th I think the reason why, why, why I've been rambling this whole time is just, I've just been saying a bunch of extra shit just to justify the failure. There is more to Aether Theory, though. Like, there is some good, I can't remember... Exactly. I'm a bit rusty, so it's not coming across the way I intended. But I think for the most part, I got the point across. I know, like, I, I'm, I know the way it's, I'm acting is a little overly humble, so it may seem like I'm faking it. Don't get it fucked up. I know I'm not stupid. Like, this is smart stuff. You can't be stupid and come up with this. I'm, I'm well aware of that. It's just... It's really nerdy and it's really pointless. And I think I'm a lot smarter now than I was back then. I think I realized that. I think I just did this stuff for approval. Like when I would show this stuff to my mom and she would tell me I'm so smart, which would make me feel all warm and fuzzy inside. But whenever I hear actual intellectual heavyweights like like Christian Von Quangsteig or Kanye West talk, it reminds me, oh yeah, no, my brain is nothing special. Like there are cerebral heights and glory that I could never reach no matter how hard I try. That's it. I have heard about different things over the years since then. Set theory is the one that people have talked about a lot um, to me personally. Um, and online, I see it on Twitter occasionally. It has to do with like logical axioms. I haven't looked into it all that much. To me, it seems like a dead end. Um, it seems to be more about the compartmentalization of thought processes as a whole rather than low level physics. And I respect that. I respect that a lot, actually. I respect the effort of people. Um, trying to pure logic their way into an answer without any experimentation. Like how I did with the contribution that I mentioned when I was eight years old. Remember that one? Like that one is by far my favorite contribution. And I really, really respect how people can understand it with no outside information, just logic alone, simply because we already know it intuitively. And I can, I can really relate to that. I respect it. I appreciate it. I mean, after all, if our logic is consistent and the logic of our universe is consistent, you know, yes is yes, no is no, existing is existing, non existing is non existing, perpetual motion is impossible, the arrow of time is 
only an observation of our experience. That means nothing if humans don't exist. You can't go back in time. Um, saying that this is a lie is neither a lie nor a truth. And saying that this is, a tr this is the truth is both a lie and a truth. And a list of all things in the universe includes that very list itself as one of those things. Or maybe not. Like, there's, there's lines of logic that you can follow. There's plenty of logical starting points that you can go down the rabbit hole of in your own mind through meditation alone, and you can get a surprising amount of information um, just, just from thinking. Um, but that sort of thing wasn't really helpful to me at the time. I didn't have the most self-control. I was 13 years old. I was a 13-year-old boy. You think I'm, I'm doing anything that deviates from what my id tells me to do? This sort of, this sort of like deep self-control, giga chad meditation style of, of learning about the world, it's super helpful in stuff like problem solving or like politics and stuff like that. But I don't know if it'll, it'll be all that helpful in like the theory of everything. And set theory is a, a really weird concept by a dude who is probably licking toads. It honestly doesn't relate um, to what I was talking about, but people like to make a big deal out of it. Oh, theory of everything, theory. And, and they, they, these aren't even, set, set theory I don't even believe does any experimentation. I think there's theories like this that just pick up steam lately. Because you can use these to make clickbait titles like, oh, six universal axioms that explain all of the universe in 60 seconds. And actually, like, you would think these gimmicks would go super viral, but nope, like 2,000 upvotes, that's it. That's not bad, but do you have any idea how popular the Black Holes Wikipedia page is? Like, there's, there's, there's better ways to clickbait. It's just, all this stuff is just, just gimmicks, in my opinion. Anything that, that blows up on TikTok or Instagram before it blows up on YouTube first, that's kind of like a surefire way to let me know that it's bullshit. And then there's, like, the, there's the, like, first order, zeroth order, negative first order if you want to go there, which nobody does. But... All of these things seem like TikTok gimmicks to go viral rather than anything with any thought put into them. And I, some pro, someone probably did. Like, it's probably people on TikTok who are taking someone's hard work and uh, making it look bad. There's probably passionate people who made these hypotheses. They put a bunch of, of time and effort into it. And then, like, a group of people who want TikTok clout decided that this would be a great way to to hop on and, and justify their beliefs to everyone else in the rest of the world, thus discrediting the whole thing, atheists and theists alike. I could be, I could totally be shitting on someone's hard work right now, talking about these orders and set theory and whatnot. But honestly, this sort of thing seems pretty stupid to me, but who am I to talk, right? I've never looked into it. I'm a science normie now. I wait for news to find me rather than finding news myself like I used to. And then there's the idea of... This one is not really talked about in the mainstream, but it's possible that we may never truly get to the bottom of all of this. Like, th that, that at the bottom of everything, the foundations of the universe... Are, are mathematics that, well, in fact, they, 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 are, they can't be anything else. It's not like we have our mathematics and the core of the universe conforms to it. Or, or we define mathematics and then we hope the universe will be, we can decide, oh, is the core of the universe mathematics or not? Whatever the core of the universe is, that becomes our mathematics. The foundation of the universe is the definition of math. So it can't be anything but math. And the thing with math is, 
it's possible that there are some problems, some hypotheses, some equations, some conjectures that we simply can never prove. And we can actually provide proofs that we can never provide proofs for them. Like there are actually many problems out there that are unproven, that we have a good idea of. However, for most of these, we still think we can do it. But what happens when we find solid proof, not of a conjecture's result, but rather solid proof that we can never truly know with 100% certainty if a conjecture is true or false? Solid proof that there can never be solid proof. And if we can be sure of that, then I believe that we can be almost certain that we will never be able to make any definitive statements about the fabric of reality. Because look, I'm no mathematician, okay? I've relied on my intuition this whole time. And my intuition tells me that there's infinitely more ways that something can be impossible to prove than possible to prove. Contingent that there are actually things out there which are impossible to prove. Which we're pretty sure there are. It's like, it's like the way I look at it, you can make it analogous to like, okay, you can't multiply two irrational numbers to make a rational number, right? So maybe in that same line of logic, the uncountably infinite number of unfalsifiable hypotheses about nature are guaranteed to be derived from other unfalsifiable elements. Maybe our clear-cut formulas like E equals MC squares, squared are just the rational and observable um, macro-emergent properties that we can understand when all of the elements of mathematics are operating in a stable environment with room to breathe. Maybe Occam's razor hasn't actually shaved that equation all the way down yet. And maybe the truly shaved down equations aren't actually equations at all. Maybe the root of all mathemat mathematics is an accidental series of paradoxes that were never meant to be looked at or understood, and that we just so happen to get lucky with our universe because our paradoxes canceled each other out. That just allowed us to paradoxically exist. I mean, we're pretty damn sure that some paradoxes restrict us from figuring out certain truths about the world. Maybe all our rational ideas that aren't blocked by a paradox are just stepping stones to higher math. And that math will always eventually contain paradoxes no matter what. And the universe just has to deal with it. You know, Legend is out a Song of Storm style. From Ocarina of Time, I mean. Like, what if when you look deep enough, there, there are no axioms that work, no reference points of starting logic? In fact, maybe the concept of predetermined axioms isn't even possible at a small enough level. Because that's what it looks like when I read these fucking wacko things that Faraday and Feynman and Friedman came up with. It's Michael Faraday, Richard Feynman, um, Feynman and uh, Alexander Friedman, in case you guys wanted to look them up. But maybe the entire universe is a, is a spinning blender of incomprehensible mathematical soup. And we're just like, we in our, in our, in our observable universe are just a drop of, of this soup stuck to the glass on the inside um, of the blender, just chilling, un, unharmed for a while and that's why our constants are the way they are and they're not changing and they're actually constant and our universe isn't being stirred up by the chaos on the bottom of the blender we're just stuck on the glass with the inability to ever truly look outside to see the hand that's pressing the buttons like like the game of life it, it's possible we may one day finally come to a conclusion that we will never actually come to a conclusion. And I'm sure 
if I dove into this when I was 13, I would have got even more depressed. But now, knowing that's a possibility, it actually makes me feel kind of good, kind of relaxed. I feel like I've grown. I'm not that tempered, tantrum-throwing kid I used to be. You know, when you really look at the math we've been given, it's actually pretty sloppy. It's like some higher being got lazy on their shift while creating our simulation and they just slacked off. Like, there's quite a few missing parts. And also, the bitter truth that most mathematicians will never admit to you, either because they aren't smart enough in other aspects to understand it without being walked through logic themselves, or simply because they're in denial, is that there is no math without faith. You can't use 1 plus 1 as a starting point without first having faith that the concepts 1 and 2 and adding exist and that they can be observed through mental exercise. It could be possible that you actually that you don't require faith. You can't ever rule it out. But I have yet to see an example of a purely mathematical statement that doesn't hinge on some kind of faith as a reference point that we can all agree on. In a way, this is kind of a giant waste of time. Like, why do all this? Is it pointless to try to understand the nature of reality? Why did history's greatest minds all collectively work so hard together to try to solve this problem? And what's the point of it? I spend so much time on this crap. That's that's a question that can only be answered by people smarter than the greatest minds in the world. If you want to know how to solve a problem, you ask a mathematician. You want to know why you solve a problem, you ask a philosopher. And as someone who spent over half my life developing a philosophy for the age of information, I've thought about this a lot, and I can, I can confidently say the reason why we spent so much of our lives banging our heads against the wall trying to figure out the most brutal, unsolvable problem imaginable is because it's fun. That's it. Just because it's fun. God is dead and we have killed him. He has been long dead since before I was born. But I am an accomplice to this great murder. That was a that was a long one. That was a really long one. Okay, let's let's speed this up.